Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the Lower Thames Crossing Task Force at 6 p.m. on the 16th of August 2021. Um, I'd like to start by going to apologies for absence. Democratic services, are there any apologies for absence this evening? Yep, so we've received apologies from Colin Black, the Assistant Director for Region and Place Delivery, uh, Robert Quick, the Resident Representative, Laura Blake, the Thames Crossing Action Group Representative, Wesley Mercer, uh, the Thurrock Business Board Representative, and Peter Ward, Business Representative. Thank you, Lucy. Um, moving on to the minutes of the previous meeting, which was held on the... Oh, sorry. I just wanted to uh, share apologies that Matt Palmer couldn't join today either. Uh, he's on leave this week. Thank you, Tim. Moving on to the minutes, uh, item agenda two, um, to approve as a quick record the minutes of the Lower Thames Crossing Task Force meeting held on the 12th of July 2021. They can be found on pages 5 to 16 in the agenda. Um, I move that the, meeting, the minutes of the meeting are held as a quick record. Are there any comments on the accuracy of the minutes? No. Okay, those minutes be accepted. Move to agenda item three, urgent items of business. Um, I have not agreed to any items of urgent business this evening. Number four, declarations of interest. Does anyone with a de de wish to declare a declaration of interest? See no hands raised. Okay, moving on to agenda item five. Um, this is going to be Highways England, uh, attendance of the Community Impact Assessment and Consultation. And Tim Wright is going to be presenting this. Um, over to you, Tim. Thank you. Um, I'll do a quick introduction and then we'll go to, we've received a number of written questions which we have answers for um, and we can talk to those tonight and then uh, questions arising from that. Um, first of all, I'd like to say, sorry, I couldn't join you in person. I, I had intended to join you in the chamber tonight. Unfortunately, I can't because I'm self-isolating. So uh, I would have liked to be there with you today. So in terms of uh, conversation, I want to start with a quick update on where we are uh, in terms of our consultation, um, feeding back on a couple of the discussions that we had last week and some of the discussion that we've had last week, sorry, last month, and the discussion we've had through uh, the period. So first of all, there was a request to undertake additional consultation events. And uh, we did go back and we had a look and we are now holding uh, two additional consultation events um, following the feedback we received from you. So uh, thank you for that feedback. It's helpful for us to know where the sort of pressure points and where the need is. We also received a request for an extended consultation from Thurrock Council, uh, as well as a number of other local authorities. So I wanted to talk to that briefly before we get to the Q&A, just to uh, allow people to understand our position. In developing our consultation programme, we did recognise the challenge of holding a consultation over the summer months and while some COVID-19 restrictions have been in place. And that's why following feedback from a number of local authorities, uh, when we engaged around the approach to consultation, we extended our public consultation from six weeks we initially proposed to an eight week consultation, which is substantially above the prescribed 28 day consultation period. We are confident that this period is more than adequate to allow residents the opportunity to understand our proposals and give informed feedback on our plans. Um, so it's worth mentioning that of all the consultations that are taking place for a nationally significant project of this kind, this public consultation is extremely extensive and comprehensive and accessible with a number of webinars, six in total, which are recorded, added to our YouTube channel, a telephone callback service with appointments with specialists, 18 public in-person consultation events, hard copies of materials sent free of charge to anyone who requests them, and consultation materials available online, including an interactive map. So as a result, we are not proposing to extend our public consultation period beyond the eight weeks that we initially set out at the start of the consultation. 
Uh, just to update on some headlines from the consultation so far, uh, we've had quite a significant response to our consultation with uh, over 1,900 total responses, the majority of which are being made online. And in fact, we've only had uh, nine paper forms. The rest have either been filling in our online surveys or, or direct responses via email. Um, that's higher than the numbers we had at this stage for both supplementary and design refinement consultation. Across all of the events, frequently raised topics have included environmental impacts, air quality, noise impacts and mitigation measures, land and property concerns, construction impacts, operational traffic impacts, environmental management, and our proposals for road user charging. So we're having a lot of good feedback from uh, your community and the other communities affected along the route. Uh, and we really are working hard to understand what they're saying uh, and to look at it in light of our current proposals. It's a very brief update on where we stand. Now, in terms of the written questions, Chair, do you want me to read the question and respond uh, and provide the response? Is that the best way forward? Yes, please, Tim. OK, so I'll work through them one by one. Um, and uh, I've, some of them we have identified uh, people, so I'll, I'll say who the question was from if I have that information. Tim, before you yes, begin, Chris. it would be extremely helpful to members um, following the meeting. Could you follow up the written questions with written answers? Yep, that's not a problem. We'll provide, um, I mean, Thank obviously, you. um. I'm not quite working to a script, but we've got, no, got no, pre-prepared no. answers and uh, we can share those. Thank you. So in the first list of questions we received, yep, this is the first one. Uh, the first set of questions from were from Laura Blake, representative of the Thames Crossing Action Group. Uh, so the first question Laura asked, and uh, you'll have to excuse me, I'm going to have to stop for a drink a few times through this. If you can't hear, I'm losing my voice. Um, so Laura asked that since uh, Highways England refer, keep referring to the economic benefits of the proposed Lower Thames crossing, can we please provide an estimated figure on the current economic benefits of the proposed LTC? So the details of the forecast economic benefits of the Lower Thames crossing will be set out in our forthcoming DCO application. We haven't set them out in this consultation because it focuses not on the overarching scheme, but on the community uh, impacts. And it's a consultation about the community impacts of the scheme. Our work to date has shown that the Lower Thames crossing will be transformative and provide a range of economic benefits for those who live and work on both sides of the River Thames and especially for people living in Thurrock. The case for the project document, which we prepared for our statutory consultation in 2018, provided more details about the benefits that we forecasted at that time. Clearly, we're reworking the numbers to provide updated information, which we'll include in our application. The ward summary documents then go beyond the pure economic benefits and uh, include a number of sections which talk perhaps about benefits that are more relevant for the communities to understand. And in particular, I think of interest in there is talk about the additional number of jobs residents will have access to within either a 30 minute commute or a one hour commute if the Lower Thames Crossing is delivered. So you can look at each ward and understand which areas become accessible within 30 minute drive or within an hour long drive and then based on standard assessment methods, we set out how many new jobs will be available based on the fact that that is a reasonable commute for people to take. We also set out a number of other benefits to the local area. Sorry, so sorry. some of these are during construction. Sorry, sorry Tim, just we to estimate. So, Tim. So, sorry, I'm just, I really think we've got to be careful with the language here. You're talking about new jobs. And then you're saying that these will be jobs that are accessible if somebody can drive an hour. So they're not new jobs, are they? No, I'm talking about jobs that will become more accessible to people living within Thurrock. Yeah, like, like I said, I think, I think we just need to be careful about the language. OK, thank you. Um, 
then I was going on to talk about construction, where we are talking about supporting an estimated 20,000 construction jobs, which to be specific, they would be new jobs because they would be related with the construction of the scheme. And many of those will be local people will be best placed to take advantage of. And we'll talk a little bit later about some of the work we're doing to encourage local supply chain. We also will see reduced traffic in key roads in Thurrock, including the A13 west of the A1089 junction and the M25 south of our proposed new junction and the Dartford crossing. And the reduced traffic on these roads, particularly on the Dartford crossing, will lead to faster journey times and um, support the local economy. So that's my answer to that question. Since uh, so the second question, uh, since Highways England have stated there won't be ventilation chimneys for the tunnels, can we please explain in detail how the tunnels would be ventilated? This is obviously a major concern for residents closest to the portals, both visually and in regard to air pollution. So within the tunnel itself, ventilation will be provided by fans located at regular intervals along the length of the tunnel. However, in normal circumstances, we expect the movement of vehicles will drive the air through the tunnel. Ventilation fans would only need to be switched on if there's stationary traffic or an incident inside the tunnel. Now, clearly, until we move to the position of zero emission vehicles, the vehicles within the tunnel will have emissions within the tunnel. That's what needs to be ventilated. That's what needs to move through. And based on the vehicle movements, that will move towards the tunnel portal and there it will be, um, it will come out of the tunnel portal into the, the um, local air flow. Now, at that point, it will be dispersed by natural air movements and that air flow will carry those pollutants dispersed away to a level that is acceptable. And in fact, inside the tunnel, the, air, the quality of the air will be acceptable because obviously we have people driving through it and, and they need to be in an acceptable air quality. In Thurrock, the nearest home to the North Tunnel entrance is located on Station Road, approximately 800 metres north of the portal, and that is far beyond the distance beyond which we anticipate that there may be a local adverse impact on air quality, which will be very close in proximity to the tunnel portal itself of the order of 50 metres. Gary, sorry, was there anything you wanted to add to that or did I cover that one? No, it's going to absolutely cover that. The, I mean, I think the, the big thing is that it's within 50 minutes, there's, there's a great thing. By 200 metres from the, the source, it's, it's dispersed. I think it's the only thing really to add, add on to that. Thank you. OK, um, the next question was, have Highways England looked into the wilderness in South Ockenden as ancient woodland, as uh, previously been requested, and, and could uh, provide an update. So, uh, sorry, what? sorry, Tim, we've got a, quick, a question for Councillor Muldowney in the chamber. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, just a couple of things. In terms of the 20,000 construction jobs that you say that the LTC will um, create, how many of those roughly will be in Thurrock? So we haven't done an assessment of where the construction jobs will be distributed. We haven't done a regional breakdown of that. What I can say is that the major construction site for the North Portal will be located in Thurrock. And as our construction proposal set out, there's a number of construction compounds that are situated along the line of the route within Thurrock. So clearly there is a substantial amount of that construction workforce that will be working within Thurrock. And because of the nature of the project, there will be jobs along the length of the route that will be accessible to people in Thurrock um, as well. Um, can, I, can you give us a ballpark? Is that going to be 30%, 50%, 40%? I mean, how many... I couldn't give you that, I'm afraid. I don't have that number. Okay. If you... If you can you, can like, we can go away and we can think about it and, and work out if there is a reasonable breakdown. Uh, we, we know how many... It'll be harder to do it for Thurrock, but uh, clearly we have one contract seated, seated north of the river for the highways, 
Um, so it wouldn't be a Thurrock number, but that would be the contract for north of the river. Um, the tunnel contract will be split across the north of the river and the south of the river. And uh, so the majority of the tunnel contract will be north of the river, but uh, there will be jobs south of the river. I don't know if it's straightforward to provide a breakdown of that. I would have to go back and talk to the team about it. Councillor, can I just interject a moment? Um, just to say um, the key, I mean, any kind of prediction would be uh, fanciful to say the least. What, what we were, what the council has been asking for some time now is for a series of targets for local employment, uh, apprentices, uh, work placements, training, that kind of thing, to be actually committed to within the DCO by Highways England. They are still considering that, as far as I understand it. Um, whether or not the skills education and employment strategy will be a control document is still up for grabs, as far as I understand it. Um, but it's the targets. Um, on a previous project, um, that Tim was aware of uh, at Tideway, they committed to 25% local and they defined local as the affected boroughs, which in, in the Tideway project was about 13 or 14 boroughs. Um, they found that extremely difficult to achieve 25%. It was more likely to achieve 20%. So we're still waiting for a response um, from Highways England about this, but I think it's, it's targets rather than predictions that might be better suited to the job. Just just a thought. Thank you, Chris. Is that something that Highways England are prepared to commit to? So we're currently working with uh, the officers to talk through our skills and employment strategy. And uh, there is a discussion about the roles that targets are could play in that. It's not something that we've committed to yet. Um, it's something that is, as Chris says, the subject of discussion between us at the moment. So as it stands at the moment, there's no commitment to any local jobs at all in Thurrock. So we have a substantial commitment around what we, there, there's a difference between committing in the DCO and what we're committed to uh, as Highways England as a responsible um, party constructing works within Thurrock Council area and the wider area. So we are committed to uh, skills and employment strategy that we already are putting in place. We have a number of interventions locally where we're working with schools. We're working to bring in local employers. We hold local employment fairs across the region. Uh, we are already doing that and bringing in local staff to our contractors. Uh, we, we brought in local staff to work on the enabling uh, the, the site investigation works that we have going on at the moment. Uh, and we'll continue to do that right the way through. We are very committed in a uh, wider sense to give local staff employment opportunities on this project and we see it as fundamental to successful delivery of our scheme. That sounds, what Chris well, that's, is referring sorry, that, to that, is to actually yeah. build those targets into the development consent order yeah. and the development consent order is a legally binding document and if you don't comply with it then you are in a sense well in a sense in, in actuality committing a criminal offence. And accordingly, we are cautious about what we build into that because we heard there from Chris that there is there are challenges in building targets into things which are not wholly in your control. We need to ensure that everything in the development consent order is absolutely something we can deliver and we cannot guarantee the engagement of the local workforce because that's a two way process. That said, we are still discussing that with the team. We are still working through that. Um, and, and that doesn't take away our commitment to absolutely employ the local workforce on this project. The local workforce from Thurrock and the local workforce from across the region. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate what you're saying. I do understand the difference between, you know, you just saying, yes, we'll do that. And it actually being in the uh, development consent order. I um, mean, it being something that you have to actually deliver. But I mean, it's obvious from that conversation as well that you're hesitant about committing to a target of say 20%, 25% local employment because you don't think that that's achievable or it's likely that that won't be achievable. The, the key councillor in all this is, is the word targets. 
you you when you set a target you don't necessarily achieve it you work towards it so setting a target of 20 or 25 percent is is no problem because you you know you're you're committed to trying to achieve it and demonstrating you're trying Yeah. Like so, I say, we're so, still so I mean, because we're, 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 we're having a community impact assess, um, consultation at the moment, and residents are being asked to comment on this. You've just brought this up as a potential benefit for Thurrock after not answering the question about the economic um, benefits. I appreciate that you haven't quite worked that out yet, um, but you are claiming it on your website. So. Um, that's a little bit problematic from my point of view. So what what I'd like to know is, would you be prepared to commit to 15% local jobs for Thurrock out of those 20,000 in your DCO? Like I say, we're having a conversation with the team at the moment. I'm certainly not in a position that I can make a commitment like that here today. Okay, thank you. The other question I had was about ventilation of tunnels. So what, what's the difference between the LTC tunnels and Dartford tunnels? Because I think they've got ventilation shafts, but we're not going to need them in the Lower Thames Crossing. Um, Gary, unless you can answer that one. I know, yeah, I can help help it. I mean, basically, there's a modern tunnel. It's a lot bigger diameter. So what we're able to do, what we've done is assess the, the flow of the air in the, the tunnel with the natural uh, vehicles traveling from one end to the other. And they, they are in one direction. So actually what you're getting is a natural um, draft through the tunnel, which actually means that as long as the, 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 the traffic is running, you'll get the, the actual ventilation naturally rather than having to, to use the fans. There will be fans there, I think, as, as Tim said earlier, but that's really to to help if there's a you know some reason there's a there's a traffic stationary in the in the tunnel we have to make sure that we we're able to keep the air in the tunnel at a, a, re, a level that uh, people can can uh, be in the tunnel at the same time. Gary, is there not a minimum distance for a tunnel length before you have to mandatory introduce ventilation like chimneys? I mean. It, there are there are lengths, but um, the, it's all dependent on gradient as well, Chris. Okay. You have to look at the gradient, and that's why you have to do the assessment on it to to make sure that you've got the right the a the right amount of fans and and when you need the fans. So my, my understanding was this tunnel is too short to warrant the ventilation columns. Um, is that correct? I. Don't, I, I mean, all I know is that we don't need the ventilation columns. We we just okay. use the use the the fans. So it's uh, that's all right. I believe um, Councillor Piccolo has got a question. Just before we do, it, can I just suggest uh, we go through? If you could go through the questions, Tim, and then we'll take a quick pause at the end of each one, see if there's any questions from the chamber that are relevant before moving on. Um, over to Councillor Piccolo. Yeah, thank you. Just um, a quick point. You're saying that if the traffic is stationary these these uh, backup uh, fan systems will come into place uh, what I know stations to, to me means not moving at all but having said that if traffic is only moving through the tunnel at five or six mile an hour then there's not going to be so to my mind there's not going to be sufficient draft caused by the movement of the traffic to ventilate the tunnel so is it possible you could be more specific to say that rather than if the traffic is stationary is if there's either you'll have a monitoring system there to check when they need to be put on because of the levels um, of toxins um, in crit or the, 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 uh, the, the, the poor air quality within the tunnel reaches that limit or whether there is a minimum speed that vehicles traveling through the tunnel will operate and kick that additional ventilation in. Gary, is that one you can uh, answer, or do we need to defer to I the team? I think we most probably need. I mean, my my understanding is that there there is monitoring in the tunnels, and they will the ventilate ventilation fans will come on when the the levels get to a to a certain level. So 
So, but uh, but I think maybe we need to come back with a with a with a response on that one. Just while we're, we're talking about ventilation, I know you you said um, there was one property on Station Road, 800 metres from the the ventilation um, opening, so to speak. Um, I'm a little, this is a, an educated guess, but I think Coal House Fort is probably be about 1,100, maybe 1,200 metres um, from the ventilation. Should we be concerned um, with that, that, those exhaust gases coming up so near a, a park? No, that's long past the area in which they will have dispersed be into natural uh, sort of air quality, and, and that would be well away from the area of... Um, any concern. What was the, the metres, um, the, the, the exact number, I suppose, that were where the concern uh, alleviates? Gary, do you want to, you're the one yeah. with the hand. Yeah, no, I'm, it, within the 50 metre from the, from the actual, the source, so a 50 metre corridor outside the, the highway, that's the, the, the mainly affected area. But then within 200 metres, it, it, that's where it dissipates. And it's at that sort of extremity that, that the the actual uh, the air quality actually just is, is sort of it gets back to to normal. So that's 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 what I've been told by our, our environmental experts. So, you know, that's how how we've monitored it. And, it, and we also have to obviously meet the regulations. So um, that so it's, it's, it's within about a 200 meter corridor, either either side of the of the highway that you would be affected. And I'm assuming these are um, wind conditions and things could play a part in, in maybe which direction these um, those meters could be sort of attributed to. The, the wind conditions actually disperse it, so actually have a, you know a, uh, a positive effect on it. They don't have a they don't uh, just blow it around because of the, the type of air qual air air uh, particulates that you're getting. As I say, I'm not an expert in this field, but that, that's what I've been told by our environmental team. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Chukwa. Um, you know, according to reports, currently we have a shortage of uh, construction workers in the country. And um, when you're talking about 20,000 workforce, how are you going to provide uh, the workforce that will carry the, the project? Apologies, Councillor, Councillor Chair, Matthew, I... could, you, could you actually repeat that? We didn't quite get that at this end. You know, according to reports now, they say there are shortages of um, construction workers in the country. Ah. So how are you going to provide 20,000 uh, workers? Any kind of training? So the number of jobs isn't all construction workers. There's a whole variety of different jobs that will be needed from uh, office staff. Uh, there will be construction workers, obviously, but uh, you can imagine that a project of this scale will require a huge amount of different skill sets. We well, do recognise that there's going to be a number of different projects operating potentially at the same time with London Resort and uh, Thurrock Flexible Generation Plant and other projects in, at the same time in the location. So there is going to be quite a lot of demand for workers in the area. That's why we're looking to work our skills and employment strategy to work with organisations to try and bring forward people with the right skill sets to put in place training, make sure that people are able to access training to get into jobs uh, to support the need. Did you want to come back with anything? Thanks for that. Sorry, okay, a um, bit all over the place, ready? but if I can come back Sorry. to um, the 50 metres around the portal entrance, isn't there a plan to have public paths on both sides of the portal, at the portals, as part of the scheme? So there are going to be a number of footpaths in the area. Um, what we have to bear in mind is the... the exposure to air quality as well and obviously we it's very different for people who have a short-term exposure uh, and you know it's quite common for people walk, to walk alongside a road for a short period of time 
versus people who are actually living in proximity to and exposed throughout the day. So when we say 50 meters and 200 meters, it's fully dispersed. That really is for a worst case scenario of somebody who is actually living proximate to the source and proximate to that air quality impact. For people who are passing by the road scheme, you know, like I say, people will be passing through the tunnel, people walk alongside the road every day um, across the entire road network with no ill effects. So there really is no need to be concerned if there's footpaths in that proximity. Um, I said parks, parks rather than footpaths, but oh, I guess it, parks are it the does. Same. It does. Parks uh, are the same. Well. People still use them, even if they use them frequently. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's quite common for there to be parks adjacent to roads. Um, and, you know, our designs are, are intended to pull that park a little bit away. The road will be in cutting at that point and, and people will be away from the, they won't be walking directly around the perimeter of the road. They'll be further south in uh, Tilbury Fields area rather than directly adjacent to the portal. Okay, I suppose it does sort of bring into question how much of a benefit the new parks are being sort of so closely situated to, to the portal. Thank you. Anyone ready for other questions regarding the ventilation? Tim, if you'd like to uh, carry on with question three, please. Uh, so the next question, I, I'll reread it. Have Highways England looked into the wilderness in South Ockenden? as an ancient woodland as previously requested? And if so, could we provide an update? So what constitute, what qualifies as ancient woodland is determined by very specific environmental guidance, which is that there's evidence of continuous woodland cover since 1600. We surveyed the wilderness specifically to see if it qualifies as ancient woodland. And at the time of our surveys in 2018, we did not detect any of the ancient woodland indicator species that would suggest that it qualifies as such. In addition uh, to a physical survey, we've examined publicly available historic mapping of the area that's been used by our cultural heritage team. And we don't have anything that confirms the presence of woodland in that area that goes back further than 1840 with any certainty. So on the basis of the botanical survey and historic map research, we've not identified this site as ancient woodland. But although it, the wilderness is not technically ancient woodland, it doesn't mean that we don't see it as important to Thurrock's natural environment, the plants and creatures that live there and the people who spend their leisure time there. So following our statutory consultation, when residents raised concern about our impacts on the wilderness, we changed our design. So we moved the alignment a little bit and we included retaining walls alongside the wilderness rather than embankments. This allows us to reduce the overall impact on the wilderness. Our proposals do affect the wilderness as we're divide, diverting a watercourse through the southern end of it. Where we do these works, we propose to replant the trees along the watercourse and overall we'll plant a greater area of woodland than we fell. Are we, any questions on that? Uh, just a, a brief one, just on, that, on the end of that sentence. Um, the trees that are we replacing, the ones that have, that have to be removed, are they going to be in immediate vicinity to where the wilderness is currently um, or somewhere else along the route? Uh, I would have to jump in and, and check the detail on that. Perhaps, Gary, can you have a look at that whilst, we, uh, whilst I move on and um, come back and, and confirm that? Is that OK? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to find out what the answer is to it, Tim. Come back. I'll just see if there's any other questions in the meantime. No, just my just my question. Sorry, was that? No, it's just my question about the immediate um, uh, vicinity of okay. the woodland. So, do you want to come back well, to that maybe later? That. Yeah, no problem. If you want to make, carry on. So, the next question: Why did Highways England not update the map books to properly show the extra slip road lane connecting the LTC to the A13 Orsett Cock Junction for the consultation? And uh, the answer to that is. The, uh, we identified the need for that relatively late on. And at the time of the production of the map books for the community consultation, the design of the extra link was still under refinement. And so we couldn't put it into the models that we needed to use to produce the maps. 
We have set out the inclusion of the new link in our operations update and reference link text in our map books and the link is explained on our website. Um, we have tried to make sure that people understand the proposals. Um, we're picking this up in our discussion with the public um, and like we did at the ta our last task force meeting where we explained why the additional slip road had been included, where it is and why it hasn't led to any changes in our proposed land take. Any member got any yeah. questions regarding the map books and changes to the AFER to the slip roads? Councillor Muldowney. Yeah, I mean, I've got quite a big concern actually about how easy it's going to be for local residents to properly engage in this consultation. So, for example, um, as I understand it, the council have yet to receive the noise impact assessment and the air quality um, impact assessment. And we're not going to be getting those until after the consultation is over. Therefore, you know, I mean, the, the, it's very technical, <laughs> a lot of this stuff. And you do have to bounce around from one telephone directory full of information to another. I've been doing that most of today, as you'll see from my notes. I didn't bring them all because, um, you know, they're too heavy. Um, but, yeah, it's constantly referring backwards and forwards. I mean, I understand it's very complex information, but if the council don't even have the informa information about air quality and noise impacts in order to be able to advise residents um, of what the likely impact is actually going to be, how can this be a, a, an adequate consultation on those matters which are very, very much at the forefront of our residents' mind, particularly in my area, which has got, um, it, which is Chadwell, which has got higher the highest levels of uh, diseases like COPD and coronary diseases outside of London. So we've already got a really big problem with respiratory illnesses and with um, heart disease and heart il illnesses, which are likely to be made worse, certainly by extra pollution during the construction phase. I've got a whole group of residents that are sitting right at the top of Chadwell there where all that 24-7 hour working is going to happen with the Brentwood Bridge construction. You've got on the other side at the top of Heath Road, you've got all the, the new junction being made there, the connection between the A13 and the A1089. And I haven't got the information and the council hasn't got the information to be able to advise these people what the impact is going to be on their health um, and what the likely air quality and noise impacts are going to be. So um, can we can we really have can we really have an adequate um, consultation? I know you said at the beginning that you were confident um, that the time that we've got is sufficient time for residents to understand and absorb all of this. But how can they do that without the council actually being able to provide the specialist knowledge that you really, really need in order to be able to understand what kind of impact this is going to have on our communities? So uh, I can answer that. Um, I think there's been some statements which have led to a bit of confusion about the nature of the material in the consultation versus the full assessments that will be finally be submitted as part of our DCO application. We have provided in the consultation material detailed assessments of the air quality impacts and noise impacts associated with both construction and operation of the scheme. And they're set out in a level that goes beyond what we have previously done in terms of representing the impacts um, so that the communities can understand that. Now, we are running final assessments that will go into our DCO submission. And that's perfectly normal that you provide an, uh, a, it's called preliminary environmental information at the point of consultation. And then you provide a full environmental assessment that goes into the DCO submission and will be considered during the examination. So my answer to that is that we have provided full air quality and noise impact information for people to understand the impacts of the scheme during, design, uh, during construction and operation. 
We're continuing, meanwhile, to work on our full assessments and we're talking to the officers in the council about sharing that information um, as, as we move forward through the process of engagement alongside the development of a project. This is absolutely normal for a project to do and that material will be fully available once we get to the point of submission and examination. The questions being raised by certain parties that because we made we have amendments and uh, assumptions built into the data within the consultation is that information truly representative of the impacts we expect and my answer to that is yes the information set out in the consultation is uh, representative of the impacts that we expect. They are fully suitable for use by the community and by the local authority to understand the nature of the impacts of the scheme. And we will continue to finalise our results and those will be taken forward into the submission and the examination. So can I, can I ask, are you absolutely confident that my residents who are suffering from COPD living within sort of 250 metres of the um, proposed route up there at the top of Chadwell will not have any adverse impacts from either construction or operation in terms of air quality, pollution, um, noise is a bit different, as, you know, because you can see there's obvious, well, I mean, noise will be difficult for, for people in um, Whitehaven, for example, with people with dementia in Whitehaven, but uh, can you hand on heart say to me you're completely confident that nothing that's going to happen during construction and operation of the LTC if it goes ahead will shorten any of my residents lives that are living with these diseases within 250 metres of the road? Obviously without looking at specific individual cases I wouldn't be able to determine that at all and the consultation materials do set out that there will be some adverse impacts associated with construction and with operation of the scheme, and that does have a public health effect. That is set out in the consultation material. It's a very complex subject. We've done our best to try and help people find a pathway through to understand how it would affect them so that they can respond to the consultation. But it is a complex field, and, and therefore the Thurrock Council also have a role to play in understanding that material and feeding it back. But feedback on the consultation material and the nature of the impacts and the health impacts that we set out in that isn't reliant on receiving the final assessments that we'll submit in our DCO. It can be done based on the information we've provided in the consultation. Councillor, if I could just interrupt, and Tim, you are maybe be aware, it may be a little unfair of me to quote some of your own documents back at you, um, but in the ward summaries section 1.6, it does say that the air quality and noise assessments are based on earlier versions of the project um, and that further work will need to be done and further reruns of the assessments will need to be undertaken. Um, and they're based, uh, you'll be updating these assessments based on comments from stakeholders. So I, I think it might be a little um, too confident to say that there won't be any change to what you've said in these ward assessments because you don't know until you run them. I've said I'm confident they're representative because we've done initial assessments to understand whether they're representative or not. I mean, clearly we will be holding our internal reviews to determine whether they are representative. And if they turn out not to have been representative, then that will be a matter that we'll need to consider very seriously. Yeah, I mean, it says they prevent, present an indicative summary of the likely effects. I'm not sure that, that the residents that Councillor Muldowney talks about will be, you know, completely um, confident with that response. I mean, there was a, I, I had a conversation with, um, uh, with your boss who can't be here tonight, whose name is just Matt, 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 uh, about possibly having a fund um, set up to assist if the, if the scheme does go ahead i hope it doesn't but if it does go ahead to assist those who are really going to be severely impacted especially during construction phase um, by pollution in the area um, those with pre-existing conditions um, those with vulnerabilities 
um, to actually make sure that they can relocate away either temporarily or permanently and that was something that Matt said he was going to take away and get back to me on but I haven't heard anything further about that I don't know if you're in a position to comment on whether that's gone any further or not thank you so there are compensation uh, requirements and we set out what our compensation requirements are in the consultation material and and if we adversely impact local residents or businesses during construction there, there is a framework through which they can seek compensation um, I think in terms of a specific fund no that's not something that is currently on the table Councillor if I could add to that there is a document in the consultation as Tim says Effectively, it's the non-statutory compensation policy. It's in the documents. I can circulate it if necessary. Um, we are in the process of reviewing it as part of our consultation response, but um, indications are, sorry to use the word, but indications are that it doesn't go much beyond um, normal statutory compensation matters. It, 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 it doesn't really help too much. Um, that That's that's the advice we're getting from our specialists. Um, it, it's there um, and it's extracted and it's fairly new for Hymers England to actually put it out there. It is a new compensation policy, but it, it, it probably doesn't go far enough, I think is probably the result that we'll come up with. Thank you, Chris. Can you actually point me to where that is? Because I, uh, I, haven't, I, mean, I haven't read everything, absolutely everything yet, but I've read quite a lot. Can you point me to where that is so I can go and have a look at it? Yeah, I'll, I'll send the document to Lucy and she can circulate it. It's, it's not a big document. Um, it's, it's a leaflet in effect. I don't know how many pages it is, but probably 10 or 15. So it, it, it won't cause you any weight problems. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Carrying it around. Tim, just before you move on, we, we were talking about um, health and, and noise, or air pollutant and, and noise. You're going to have, um, I'm guessing, some sort of technical devices to, to monitor this throughout the, the construction and... Um, of the road. How long do these devices stay sort of up and monitoring and, and being looked at and reviewed? So the proposal is that the monitoring will be in place during the construction period. Um, we're talking about putting some in uh, early to get a baseline to understand what the conditions are like now and then they'll be in place through the construction period. And once vehicles start actually using the road will, will they be still be continuing to monitor um, these these levels? There's not currently a proposal to monitor either air quality or noise following opening of the road, no. So we won't have figures looking at pre-Lower Thames Crossing and post-Lower Thames Crossing about how those, those, have, those numbers have changed for the local communities along the route? So we monitor traffic. Uh, in order to understand how traffic flows change as a result of it, but we aren't proposing to monitor air quality, no, or noise. Is that something that could be uh, could be added <laughs> to the scheme? Or I can take it away for consideration. Yeah, please do. Thank you. Um, I believe you're on question four, unless any of the members have any questions. Uh, I think there's Councilor, another question from Councilor, the chamber. Yeah, Councillor Piccolo. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, <clears throat> you're saying that it's not going to be monitored after the completion of the project. Um, and to a certain extent, you're marking your own homework. You're saying it's not required to monitor what happens after you've completed it um, because your figures um, say there's not going to be a problem. Um, I don't think that's at all acceptable you wouldn't expect um, going into a um, hospital to have a major operation um, and the surgeon saying, well, everything will be all right afterwards and you're not having regular checkups to see what's going on. I think there needs to be at least a year or 18 months monitoring after the completion of the project to make sure that the predictions that you're and, and, and the summaries that you're making at this time are actually proven and it's not either worse. It may be that it'll be better and you can even say what a fantastic job you've done. But we need to know, it's no good on the day you open it up saying that's it, we're not gonna monitor anymore. We need to know to our satisfaction that it's not causing a long-term problem. 
So there's a number of complexities to look into um, in terms of that, because uh, you'll be you know, fully aware that Thurrock in 2029, 20, 2030 will look different to Thurrock as it currently stands because of other developments and other, other works going on. But as I said to the chair, um, I'm, I will take this one away. I, I, I'm hearing very loudly what, what your request is. I will take that away and, and I will talk to the team about it. Come back. No, no, thank you. So it's, 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 it just makes sense to me that um, we we need to check our own. It, I mean, I'm letting you check your own homework, but someone needs to check it to make sure that what we're assuming is correct. But thanks very much for uh, taking okay. the point on board. Hello, Tim. Do you want me to just come back on the wilderness? Yeah, if you could, please. Uh, yeah. Shall I just? Sorry. Shall I just check, uh, Chair? Are we are we finished with that question? I think question four, yes. So if you could come back on the wilderness, then go on to question five. Yes. So I've just I've looked at the uh, the, the drawings, and what it does show is that there is new planting uh, around the watercourse adjacent to the wilderness, and also on the south side of LTC between Lower Thames Crossing and South Ockingdon. Thank you. And, and the watercourse, I, I I made a note. It's going to be um, retaining walls. Uh, which direction is it? Is, does it go now? Which direction are these retaining walls going to have on the impact of that watercourse and, and where it ends up? Yeah, the, 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 the watercourse actually is split by LTC. So what we've had to do is run it along the northern side, which is in between Lower Thames Crossing and the, the wilderness. Hence the reason why we put the, the retaining wall there. It's also on the south side. There's a section on the south side. So that will also have a retaining wall on the south side and the, the, the watercourse is diverted um, parallel to Lower Thames Crossing on the south side, and then obviously re reconnects to where where it where it was on the the eastern edge. I'm just trying to visualise that in my in my head, but I know there's quite a large um, landfill area, uh, not too far from the wilderness. Is it going to be directed towards that or, or away from it? It goes it goes towards. I mean, on the on the south side of the scheme, it goes towards the landfill site. And on the north side, obviously, you've got the, Le the Lower Thames Crossing scheme, and then it will be on the north side of the scheme as well. Because, as I said, we actually we do sever that watercourse, so we have to to run it until it connect reconnects back into its existing existing um, ditches. But if I can jump in there, just because uh, I'm not sure if I'm sort of prejudging a line of of question in there. We design our watercourses very closely with the Environment Agency because, sorry, I'm not sure if that's an echo at my end, uh, because uh, re diversion of a watercourse is a matter for the Environment Agency to take very close interest in, as is the protection and um, maintenance of uh, landfill, landfill protection and so on. So, and, and you know, we talk with the landfill owner as well, who have a legal responsibility over the nature of their landfill. So, we're looking very carefully to make sure that as we redivert watercourses around that area, they don't either cause an adverse impact on the landfill or cause the landfill to have an adverse impact on the wider environment. And that area is very carefully regulated and will be set out. There'll be a number of assessments within our, our DCO application which will set out that that, that is an. Uh, and not going to happen. So, as it will be pushed in between the, the, the lower Thames Crossing, I say pushed, sort of bring it right down to a, a real simple term, but between the lower Thames Crossing and a, and a landfill, will Highways in carry out in investigations into what's actually in that landfill that potentially could be nearer to the watercourse than it is at the moment? So we talk with Veolia about the nature of the landfill and the protection that they have in place to contain the contaminated material stored within that area. And the investigation we've done is to check that the proximity of our um, works don't breach the containment that effectively protects that area. So we won't be investigating what is actually in that landfill. Um, but we talk very closely with the Environment Agency, like I say, and Veolia, who own the landfill, to make sure that what we're doing doesn't have an adverse effect. OK, thank you. Any further questions from the wilderness before I let Tim move on? If you carry on, please, Tim. OK. 
So the next question, uh, can Highways England provide full details of how long they predict road closures to be for each road? Um, I think the answer to that is it is set out in the consultation material, but there is a further detail on that. The info in the consultation material seems to contradict itself. For example, page 321 in the ward impact summary uh, states the southern end of Baker Street being closed for 16 months. Yet on page 354 in the same deck document, it states the southern end of Baker Street will be closed for five years. Would it be 16 months or five years? So I look carefully into this one. Like I say, the, the closures and the impacts are all set out in the ward summaries, but I understand why the questioner was uh, looking at this and trying to understand it. So I'd like to clarify. The road section of Baker Street will be closed to traffic for 16 months. Now that road carries both the road and a footpath alongside that road. The footpath is proposed to be closed for five years. The reason for this is that the road passes right the way through the centre of a major construction area whilst we build the A13 junction. And during the construction phase, we're going to use that road for both allowing public traffic along it, but also construction traffic through careful control and make sure that it can be done in a safe way. But because of this use of the road and the nature of it right in the heart of our construction area, we cannot be sure that we can keep this route safely open for more vulnerable users. And so we've reported closure of this public right of way for the duration of construction in this area. Uh, the 16 month for closure of this stretch of, Baker, of the Baker Street Road and the five years of the public right of way closure overlap. So the total duration for the public right of way will be five years, not five years plus 16 months. Now, we do recognise that that is quite a significant closure for people who use that right of way. Um, the diversion route through this period would be via High Road, Rectory Road and the A1013. Um, but we are continuing to look at this particular area to see if there is a way using local footpaths or, or looking at our construction program that we can maintain it open. We would be looking to the contractor to maintain it open if we can. Um, but in terms of actually setting out our impacts, it's appropriate to provide where we are at the moment in our understanding rather than uh, set a false expectation. Five years seems like a, an awful long time, but um, Councillor Muldowney has a question. Thank you. I mean, on the subject of um, specific times, residents have been asking me, they're very concerned about Brentwood Road closures. Um, reading the um, community impact summaries, the ward impact summaries, I've got a 12 to 14 months timescale for Brentwood Bridge, uh, although I understand from delving into some of the further detail that that won't be... It, there won't be closures for the whole of that. It won't be closed for the whole of that time. There's also further closures, I think, down the Brentwood Road um, to move a gas main, uh, definitely to move a gas main. There might be some other utilities work. Can you give us an idea within those 12 to 14 months or 12 to 24 months, I think the figures were for the other, the other ones on Brentwood Road, how... How much, how, what percentage of that will the road actually be closed? I know that you'll, you'll try and keep it open and do works alongside, but is it 10% of that time, 20% of that time? People are really concerned about this. I know they've been going to consultation events and being told, some of my residents sort of in Courtney Road, Wickham Road area have been told that um, they, there may be times when they cannot access their homes. Um, so first question was, how much of that, the time period, is, is the road going to be closed? And also, what mitigation will be put in place for those residents who can't actually get home? You know, who, who can't actually get home or who are right near that um, utilities compound where there will be a weekend and overnight works, which are mentioned in the consultation documents so i've been looking to check and i believe um the uh we'll, we can come back to you specifically in writing because i will need to confirm this because i've just been checking live as we speak 
but the closures on Brentwood Road are fairly limited around specific utilities works. So they won't be long extensive closures. They'll certainly be relatively small proportions of the time in that period. Um, during that time, we would be ensuring that anybody who was affected by that would have access. So, um, you know, nobody is going to be sealed in or out of their property during that period. Uh, Gary, do you have anything else you'd add to that? I've had, I've had residents who've actually been told um, at your consultation events that they won't be able to get access to that. Their, their, there may be times where they won't be able to access their properties. No, okay. sorry. Sorry, Tim. No, I haven't. I, what you said was what, was what I'd seen. But uh, I think, as you said before, we most probably could come back in writing on this one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That'd be helpful. Councillor, um, we have raised um, uh, recent meetings with Highways England um, the fact that there are a number of closures of public rights of way, particularly public rights of way, for various periods of some months to some years. We've precious little in the way of mitigation um, and they are currently now looking at trying to provide alternative routes um, for those closures or for those diversions um, but we will be um, pressing them on this because shutting down footpaths for years at a time just isn't acceptable. Thank you Chris. There may be some areas where we do have to shut down footpaths for long periods of time and whilst we can look at alternative routings providing direct diversions may be challenging um that's yes, I what i'll that. say there yeah. yeah yeah fair enough i mean just coming back on the, on the detail of Brent, brentwood road if when, if that road's closed basically there'll be there's no access through heath road the only access will be through riverview and tilbury I think a major concern that's been raised with me and I think I raised at the last meeting is that we, we you know, in Chadwell and Tilbury, we already have very, very sort of long waiting times for emergency services. We're sort of quite cut off as it is from Basildon Hospital, which is our nearest accident and emergency service. And closures like this are going to make it even worse. Um, so what... I mean, that uh, potentially we've got, we've got health impacts of the LTC, which not only will have an impact on people's health, but also will have an impact on emergency vehicles being able to to get to our residents in these areas. So have you looked at mitigation for that aspect of it? I couldn't actually, I may have missed it, but I couldn't actually see that in the community. In so the each of these road closures would be, um, as it comes forward, would have to be set out in our traffic management plan, which is a required assessment for a uh, document that we put through for approval prior to the start of that aspect of the works. And that would be consulted with a number of parties. And part of that would be discussion both with Thurrock Council and, uh, and other parties, including emergency services, to make sure that we understood any concerns and, and could account for any concerns of the emergency services regarding access during that time. But this isn't something that you're consulting on in with these ward impact consultations? So there's a level of information that will only be able to brought, bring forward once we actually have a defined detailed construction plan for the scheme which is set out at uh, the point of construction so part of the consultation sets out the control measures we're putting in place like the outline traffic management plan for construction which then leads to what control measures will be put in place at the time of construction and matters like that are a reasonable thing to, uh, so, you know, to look at the outline traffic management plan for construction. If, if you have concerns that it doesn't provide enough engagement or, or, or role for the emergency services in that, then that's certainly somewhere to, to respond and certainly somewhere we would consider very seriously if you don't think it's sufficient as it stands. Uh, it's certainly a big concern that's been reported to me and that I've raised as well at previous previous meetings. Um, the bank that is alongside the crossing where it becomes closest to Chadwell by Chadwell Flats on Godman Road is only three metres high. How much protection is that 
going to give um, local residents in those flats from pollution and also on that road, at the top of that road, um, from pollution and from noise pollution. Sorry, I, I lost the sound a little bit there, but I, I think it was the the embankment along, or, or the, the false embankment along that stretch. Our, our assessments set out what the air quality impact of the scheme will be at, at, at key areas. I would have to go in and look at the information to um, work out exactly what the impact is at that location that you're asking. And uh, I, I'm afraid I can't do that live. Um, I mean, I could, but I think you'd all be sitting there waiting for me to do so while I check my facts and make sure I get it right. So uh, I suggest I'd come back to you in writing on that one. Okay, thank you, Tim. I think that's question five, um, exalted in the chamber, Tim. If, how many questions have you got out of interest? To, uh, so I think... There are 25, 25 in total. Okay, I'll let you go on to number six then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was the closures. Uh, traffic questions. Can Highways England explain how it seems they are stating that AM peak traffic only has a 10 to 20 percent increase, yet PM peak traffic has a 20 to 40 percent increase? Why is that? How can the peak traffic, peak hour traffic in the evening be twice as much as it is in the morning? So it doesn't relate to specifically where we're talking about this question. I can't link it to a specific road, but I can give a more general answer, which is that um, the traffic changes through or traffic movements uh, through the day vary people make different journeys not everybody is leaving home in the morning peak and returning in the afternoon or, or the evening for example some people go shopping in the afternoon and hgv journeys vary throughout the day so you'll see different traffic flows at either side because not everybody is doing the sort of 7 a.m to 5 p.m uh, commute um, and, and that's what's effectively reflected in these figures. Any answers or questions on that? No, can't see any questions from, oh, one, well, Councillor Muldown. Not exactly on that, but I've got a related question because it's about um, sort of additional traffic movements through, um, well, Brentwood Road again. Uh, is going to be up by 20 to 40% once, once, once the road's in operation. Um, so it is going to have quite a bad impact on our local roads. And also there's going to be additional traffic, I think a more heavy traffic on the A1089 on the other side uh, of Chadwell. So we're going to have the LTC going across the top. We're going to have um, Brentwood Road with additional 20 to 40% traffic on one side and we're going to have um, more than that, I think, sorry, I think Brentwood Road is 10 to 20 percent more and then on the other side the A1089 is 20 to 40 percent more traffic. So in Chadwell we're just going to be sitting in this toxic triangle, yet I'm still being told, Highways England is still telling us that is not going to have any impact on our air quality or noise pollution. So all of the traffic Sorry? Is that, no. I didn't, I didn't uh, say anything. I, I get a little bit of an echo sometimes, so <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm speaking over somebody or, or not. Um, all of the traffic changes in the, in the, uh, the, both on our road and also off our road are accounted for in our traffic modelling. So our traffic modelling shows those changes and then that modelling is what is used to inform the air quality assessment that comes as a result. So our modelling does show the air quality impacts associated with all of that. And uh, as Gary said, the, the air quality impacts associated with the road are relatively localised and um, certainly uh, will not create this sort of uh, large expanse of uh, air quality concern across the region. And in fact, what we do see is where um, once we open, we get substantial improvements in air quality over in Dartford. 
where the the reduction in traffic and the better flow of the traffic actually reduces the air pollution for a number of people in across that side of the authority area and um, people where alongside the M25 and the uh, A13 and people who are adversely impacted by the air quality in those regions do see improvements. Well, I mean, whilst I'm happy for people south of the river, my constituency is north of the river and it's in Chadwell and we're going to get more traffic um, on our local roads um, from the information that you've given us in your own consultation. Um, so it's, it's, it's beginning to be a, diff it's a very difficult case to sell that there are going to be any benefits for Chadwell residents from this, the the LTC crossing? I, in terms of benefits to Jadwell residents, I'll, I'll refer back to um, you know what I talked about in terms of the ward summaries and the vastly improved access across the river and across the region that people living in Chadwell will have following the opening of the Lower Thames crossing. Does that really outweigh the, <laughs> the much worse conditions in terms of additional traffic and air pollution and noise? that the LTC is going to bring? Any scheme has um, positives and negatives, and, and those don't necessarily all align across the same communities, across the same area. That's the role of the planning process, is to look at this in consideration of the whole and make a determination about whether we should receive consent or not. OK, thank you. I'll leave it there. Any further questions regarding the traffic? No? Uh, continue, please, Tim. Um, I'm just going to draw my blind. I think you can see a quarter of my face illuminated, maybe. <laughs> Plus, I was getting slightly dazzled. OK, um, the next question in relation to volume to capacity information, which we've set out in the consultation information. Where can we find details of the capacity of the roads and what is the capacity of the proposed Lower Thames crossing? So we don't normally report the capacity because, uh, first of all, it, it varies a lot across the d different scheme. The capacity is calculated in reference to industry standard calculations that reflect the road number of lanes, speed limit and the gradient. And we don't present that because I think the, the key information is the, the total volume and the volume in relation to the capacity rather than the design capacity. And it would be different for every element of the scheme has a slightly different capacity. Um, the modelling accounts for that. But there is, a I'll there is a specific question I'll answer specifically. The capacity of the Lower Thames crossing as it passes through the tunnel is 6,360 passenger car units per hour. Now, a passenger car unit is a unit we use to relate to the amount of road space taken by a vehicle. So one car is one passenger car unit, but an HGV is two and a half passenger car units. The capacity of the Lower Thames crossing will be different for each slip road and different stretches of ro road uh, elsewhere. So for example, the capacity of the LTC tunnel is reduced slightly from the design standard for three lanes due to the slope in the tunnel. Because there's a slope, there's slightly less capacity on that stretch of the road. So the 6360 number I gave is slightly lower than you would have if the uh, Lower Thames Crossing Tunnel were completely flat in elevation. Um, so it's a very complex thing that doesn't even follow one stretch, one length of road. It is short stretches even of that road. And uh, the volume over capacity is the important information. Any questions on that? I don't believe there is. I'm just uh, trying to take those numbers in. And so 6,360 per hour um, cars, or, and obviously the lorries change that. Passenger the car day. units. Passenger car units. Car equivalents. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, please continue. OK, next question. Uh, can Highways England explain why we're now predicting a 21% instead of 22% decrease in traffic at the Dartford crossing if Lower Thames crossing goes ahead? And would this figure drop again if things like London Resort were taken into account for the modelling? 
and then uh, can Highways England remind us why London Resort has not been included in the traffic modelling? So two in one there, I'll answer the first first. Um, so we set out in the operations update available in the consultation that um, we've updated our traffic model since supplementary consultation. And alongside the change in opening year, we've also updated the developments that we've explicitly included into the transport model. And uh, this can be seen in figure 4.1 of the operations update. And there's a lot of new developments around the Dartford crossing which affect the proportion of the traffic using the Dartford crossing that are forecast to move to use the project when it opens. Now, I'm going to go off script here a little bit because I don't have it written down in front of me. But for example, the Amazon um, depot and a number of other large facilities have been constructed near to the Dartford crossing. So as we update it, we reflect not only the change in opening year for us, but we reflect the changes in other uh, developments in the area which will by themselves be taking up further capacity on the Dartford crossing. So on the London resort not being included in the traffic modelling, uh, the proposed London resort has not been included within our transport model, um, which is in short because the complexity and scale related to the information provided on the London resort, we've not yet been able to include it into the modelling. We do plan to set this out in the operations, uh, in, in the update that we'll provide into our DCO submission, where we're going to treat the London resort as a sensitivity analysis to the main model, so that you'll be able to see the traffic changes associated with our project, and alongside that, the traffic changes associated with the London resort project. In terms of would this figure drop again if things like London Resort were taken into account in modelling, it depends on the nature of the scheme and how it reflects. You know, some some will impact on flows, some won't. And uh, our traffic modelling, when we complete it, will show within the sensitivity analysis whether London Resort has an impact on that figure or not. Any questions? I don't believe so. Uh, question number nine, please. OK, uh, so then uh, a sort of follow on question really from that, because it's relating to the same uh, assessment as in the same figure of uh, reduction in flows in uh, Dartford Crossing. Why do Highways England predict it, it will drop further to just 14 percent by 2044? So the forecast flows across the Dartford Crossing um, will do reduce over time and uh, by 2044. Uh, we, we estimate or we model forecast that they will reduce to a 14% reduction. As population increase and new development opens, traffic is forecast to increase, which results in people making different decisions in their routing. And also, as we construct open the Lower Thames Crossing and, and traffic reroutes from the Dartford Crossing across onto the Lower Thames Crossing, that opens up um, capacity on the Dartford Crossing and that capacity will be used. Many of the new users will be people living locally to the crossing who will then be able to make journeys over the crossing that would have been difficult without the Lower Thames crossing being in place. So whilst, yes, there, there is a, a, the Dartford crossing does, uh, the, the reduction in traffic on the Dartford crossing does decrease over time, Many of that should be seen as a benefit to the local community who have been trapped on one side of the river and now are free to uh, cross the river. Any questions on that one? Councillor Muldowney. Yes, thank you. I think this is this is the, uh, from what you're saying, this is the idea that uh, when there is a, another crossing there, people who wouldn't have thought of going to work in Kent or whatever will suddenly go, oh, I can actually get, I can actually get there now without being stuck at the Dartford crossing for however long. Um, I'm going to get a job in Kent or get a job somewhere else. Which so we've got this, we've got this um, mechanism by which you build another road and it just fills up again. So roads actually create more traffic um, when perhaps if we think about climate change we should be um, well I mean it's just been announced that we need to stop building roads 
this is probably a little bit out of your ballpark, but isn't the building of this road completely at odds with the climate ambitions of the government as they stand at the moment? And in fact, most of the people on the planet that we actually want to address climate change, not build something that's going to release tons and tons and tons of carbon um, into the atmosphere in a way that we can't mitigate. So I suppose my question is, is there a proper plan for mitigating the carbon release that will be involved in this project? And is that something that will be part of your DCO submission? So I think I can break that question into three different sort of answers. Um, the first one is about whether we induce new traffic. So we've looked carefully at whether we induce new trips and, and whether we cause people who wouldn't otherwise be traveling to start traveling by creating new capacity and the amount of new trips created is very small um, most of the journeys that people are making are journeys that they would be making anyway and, and by far you know i mean i'm talking very small percentages so we're not creating new trips with this scheme some people isn't will that be, the uh, isn't that the opposite of what you just said though that's uh, you just said that um, you know people won't be trapped over here anymore, and they'll be they'll be able to. <laughs> yeah. If I may continue, some people were making different journeys, so they would be making a journey anyway. They now make a different journey and 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 choose a different route, and that route takes them over the Dartford crossing. So we then look to see how much does that actual do do those journeys actually increase in length. Rather than different selection of journeys, how much do they increase in length? And uh, that, again, is a fairly small percentage, larger than the new trips, but uh, of the order of 1% uh, increase in length in journeys. Sorry, so I'm, I'm very... I'm overall, very... whilst we do encourage people, or we do um, enable people to make different journeys, there's not a substantial increase in the overall number of miles travelled. There is an increase in the number of miles travelled, and, and we shouldn't ignore that. And that is reflected in our carbon, which I'll come back to in a moment. But um, but it is a, a small proportion of the overall miles travelled. So then secondly, it does this project align with the government's aspirations and, uh, and more than aspirations, government policy and guidance, uh, bearing in mind the legislative requirements around achieving carbon, uh, zero carbon by 2050. Uh, and so on. The Department for Transport recently published their Transport Decarbonisation Plan, which sets out the policies that they intend to implement in order to achieve the uh, legislated targets. And that identifies that actually a strong road structure remains absolutely critical to achieving that target. We have to maintain efficient and effective movement of goods around the country. We have to keep the economy going in order to support the um, overall need of the country to change its policy. Dartford Crossing will remain an issue long into the future and a lower terms crossing is required to make sure that we can continue to move goods around the country and is entirely aligned with the transport uh, Department of Transport decarbonisation plan. We are looking carefully at the carbon footprint of the scheme and at the future positioning in terms of carbon mitigation. We're doing an awful lot in construction to look at driving down the construction impacts. Um, and, you know, we continue to look at where we can push further. And we are talking with Thurrock Council about what further initiatives could be implemented. I, I, you know, and looking at how we can drive down our carbon emissions during construction. In terms of operation, we do look to reduce our emissions as much as we possibly can. So, for example, uh, renewable energy for all of our power supplies, um, and, and there are small amounts of uh, offsetting considered in terms of the planting, though that's not really a substantial amount. Now, at the moment, there is no policy around offsetting uh, carbon for the scheme in operation. So um, that sits within the government framework set out by the decarbonisation plan, where the focus is really to get HGVs and cars 
to emit zero emissions during operation. And that fits into the national requirement to have HGVs and cars um, avoiding any carbon emissions in operation, which will need to be in place by 2050. We know that the government's banned um, sale of fossil fuel using cars from 2030 and that they're consulting to introduce a ban, I believe it's uh, 2040 for HGVs. I, I may have that date wrong, but I believe it's 2040, um, which will lead to uh, zero emissions coming from fleet using the road network. Councillor Kent? Any questions on that one? Yeah, sorry, I just want to probe the, 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 this just, just a little bit further. So, so the argument is that these aren't new journeys, these are different journeys. Is, yes. is, have I kind of understood that? So, so, so yes, think, that's correct. So I think if you look at uh, travel to work patterns for people living in Thurrock, the two big blocks of, of movement are people that live in Thurrock and work in Thurrock, and the second is London. If, if we're now saying that new job opportunities are going to be opened up south of the river, then a lot of those new journeys will actually be cars where previously there were people travelling on public transport. You, you, know, you, you have to accept that that's going to have a, 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 an impact on the, 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 the carbon footprint of, of the project, and it's going to put more cars on the road, surely. So our modelling is done according to um, the standards set out by the Department for Transport and how you account for this. I can't answer that fully. I'd need to go back to our technical team to get a fully developed answer from that. But my understanding is we do consider the uh, the role of public transport as well in that in that you know, creating that demand. But you said that's one of the big, you know, your, your highways England, and it's, it's an argument that was lost long long ago. Uh, it, it's, it's virtually impossible to commute by public transport in, in, into Kent from, from, from Thurrock. You, you, know, you know, this crossing, if we're going to be saddled with it, should have been multimodal and should have had uh, some kind of, 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 of train uh, line built into it. Councillor, um, if I could just add to that very valid point. Um, we have made proposals to Highways England to stress the point that whilst it's true uh, public transport can use the tunnel, clearly it can, um, however when it gets to either end of the tunnel and particularly to the north it has to take quite a circuitous route um, in order to get to places where people live and work, in other words where they might catch the, the bus. Um, we have suggested that um, a, smite, a slight alteration to the emergency axis would allow uh, buses to use that. Um, that's been rejected by Highways England and therefore any public transport would have to take that circuitous route and that would probably add, I, I, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes to the journey and that would discourage public transport use and possibly even bus operators in running it. So um, it's, it's not following national policy in any way on public transport provision, other than the fact that you can use the tunnel. So um, this is a discussion that Chris and I have had a number of times. Um, and uh, our answer is, first of all, uh, you know, public transport can use the route. Um, more importantly, we are developing the Tilbury Link Road project separately from the Lower Thames Crossing that would provide an excellent connection um, into the local authority area. So uh, we are looking to the Tilbury Link Road to provide better connectivity. We have to think of the strategic road network as a number of different elements that are being brought forward, not necessarily look to one problem project to solve the entire problem. And then finally, because of the reduction in congestion crossing the Dartford Crossing, there are currently buses that run over the Dartford Crossing and they see a substantially improved journey time, providing much better connectivity over the, the uh, Dartford Crossing for people who want to use those bus routes from those population centres. Councillor Muldrowney. 
just want to remind everybody that this project will produce 3.2 million tonnes of carbon in operation and 2 million tonnes of carbon in construction. So I eagerly await your mitigation report plan for that. Um, from what I understand, bus companies have said that the route across the LTC is not viable. That's my understanding of it. I don't have a specific answer to that one. I can look in to see whether the bus companies have advised anything in particular. You follow up on that. Uh, Councillor, right we have actually, as part of the paper we submitted to Highways England, we have done some kind of market demand work, albeit um, preliminary and tentative, indicating that it would could be possible. Sorry, could be possible. Um, to 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 actually um, be a profitable service, um, but we haven't had a response back on that yet. Thank you, Chris. Um, just going back to you talked about electric vehicles and zero emissions. I know they're obviously a lot better for the environment. They do come with other uh, issues in terms of brake dust and and clutch steel could be uh, sort of PM two point five and things like that. But you said about maybe I think it's twenty forty or HGVs would be. Um, electric only, um, so they're not gonna, we're not going to see really any electric HGVs on the LTC because it's 20 years away as such. But I know what there is available commercially now is, is the Lightfoot vehicles, the little vans, they're electric right now. So will the LTC just um, only use electric uh, vans and, and cars? So where we're talking the um, routine staff vehicles and uh, the electric buses. Um, so looking at um, uh, if we're providing shuttle bus services, then we are committing to use uh, zero emission vehicles. Uh, I, I want to leave the option open for hydrogen as a, a, a possible solution there, because I think I think we're going to see quite a lot of technology change over time. So I, I don't want to uh, land on one particular solution when there might be other options but the the key is zero emissions so yes we are committing to use zero emission vehicles for a number of the vehicles that we use it won't be for all of the vehicles that operate uh, during the construction of the scheme um, clearly you know there's going to be developing need for different things um, and there's going to be a lot of uh, heavy vehicles and a lot of uh, specialist vehicles and, and other vehicles operating but uh, we can come back in writing with the specific uh, commitment that we're providing. But yeah, we are committing to use electric or zero emission. I'm um, catching myself out. Zero emission vehicles. Appreciate that, Tim. If you could yeah, clarify that in writing, that would be fantastic. Any other questions? We'll go on question nine. No, please continue. No. OK. Next question. Um, we state on page 126, yes, I haven't answered this one, of the operations update that we predict traffic on the Dartford crossing in 2029 to be 168,200 vehicles daily and 183,100 vehicles daily in 2044 without the LTC. In reality, when in, this is the question, by the way, when in reality the Dartford crossing is currently running between 155 and 180,000 vehicles per day. Where do these predictive figures come from? And they don't seem very realistic, especially when the predicted traffic growth between 2016 and 2026 has previously been stated to be 17 to 23% increase. So the, um, the transport model is built to reflect conditions on the road network for an average weekday in March. And as with any average figure, there's going to be periods of time where flows are both higher and lower. In relation to the forecast future growth figures, these vary in each location across the network. Growth at areas that are heavily congested, such as the Dartford Crossing, are forecast to increase by a substantially lower level. For example, in the AM peak, traffic is forecast to grow only by 9.8% between 2026 and 2029 
on the Dartford crossing over a 13 year period. And you would expect that, you know, where there's congestion, there will be less growth in traffic. Where, where there's no congestion, that growth is uh, unconstrained and therefore likely to be higher, depending on all sorts of local changes on the network, as well as uh, assumptions that come from the government about how the network grows. Any questions? No, can't see on that one. Okay, next question. Can we have further clarification on the 24 seven working hours? Now, this is quite a lengthy response. Um, uh, so uh, just to warn you, I guess. Um, we've developed more information on our planned working hours. Uh, we need to carry out 24 hour working at our tunnel launch site in East Tilbury, and that's shown in our saw ward summaries. Um, and to complete the work as early as possible um, and, and reduce construction risk, and we propose tunneling activities. It's a bit more than that, actually. Once the tunnel boring machine's in place, it, it needs to run continuously. And, and that's why we have 24-7 uh, working in the tunnel launch site. That is standard practice for any tunnel job of this nature. Um, and, and you'll see that repeated at, at any construction job that has a tunnel of this size. Um, so we, we set out a number of works in the ward summary and the controls that we'll put in place around that. I think where the question's really going is looking at um, what additional locations we're proposing to carry out 24-7 works. And we've identified a number of areas where we're going to be carrying out, uh, you know, we've called them new 24-7. Um, now, the name new we've used to highlight the responses to the, or highlight to the communities, that these are ones that haven't been set out before. They have been included before in the overarching consideration and the works that we proposed, but we haven't declared them individually. Um, any construction program like this will require a certain amount of 24-7 working, especially in terms of safe working on the road network and in terms of uh, making sure that we can carry out the works, reducing the impact on the road network to the maximum extent. Clearly, the A13 and the A2 are, are really important roads, and therefore, could, because we'll be causing disruption on the roads all the while that we're working, uh, we want to get those works completed as soon as we can, and therefore, we'll be looking to do 24-7 work and to minimise the impact on that. Other times we'll be carrying out 24-7 working because we want to carry out the works where they're least disruption. So, for example, if we want to connect a road and we have to, so for, uh, you know, some of the road uh, where we build a road offline and bring it back online, we'll have to close that road down and reopen it in order to avoid impact on the people using that road. We'll do that overnight so that uh, it's there for people to come home on in the evening and, and then the next day they'll go out on a different route. But um, so we do works for that. That's where we've set out in quite a lot of detail the the sort of new areas where we're going to be doing 24-7 working across the piece. Information on 24-hour working is included in the Code for Construction Practice. And it's worth bearing in mind that we'll be putting in place quite a number of controls over the 24-7. And furthermore, any 24-7 working uh, will be done under the control of uh, what's called a Section 61 consent, um, which is under the Control of Pollution Act 1974, um, which is a consent that we work with the local authority to achieve. So that is an agreement on the amount of noise that can be made during those works, the sequencing and, and how those works are to be taken place will be worked in association with Thurrock Council if it's in Thurrock and, and, and under the form of a consent which provides then a control over the noise that we can make during that period and the works we can undertake. Um, are there any questions on, I'm, I'm going to hit a few more questions in a row because they all relate to the same matter. And I think I've answered some of them a little bit. So why are they Jim, being, oh, Jim, before, you, before you carry on, um, certainly the uh, COCP does actually set out a list um, of 24 hours. I mean, I, I can accept the, the 24 hour working for tunnels because it's quite normal. It's been going on for 20, 30 years now. But you've got over the whole route, you've got 35 locations 
four 24 hour utility routes and you've got almost 30 locations in the north that may include Havering, of course, but 30 locations for working uh, 24 hours on roads. Um, so whilst that is clear, it's not mapped anywhere. Neither are, well, I couldn't see any reasoning behind why you would need to do this. Um, if, if it's a, a, a possession for a railway or something, I get that. But, you know, that, that sheer number of 24 hour working is unusual in my view and I just it would be helpful to see it mapped and it would be helpful to see the reasoning behind why you need to do it beyond a program one. I would be happy for our team to sit there and, and take Thurrock through those. I don't believe that that's necessary information to understand the impacts. Uh, and some of the discussion is quite technical in nature and uh, the consultation pack, we've already heard comments on the size of it. We can provide, you know, we have to find a judicious balance. So setting out that it needs to take place is uh, what we've done in the consultation material more than happy to sit down with council officers and talk them through each one in turn so that they understand the nature of the works. Um, yeah, I suppose what I was I was getting to is, could you write down the reasoning why you need to do this? Uh, you know, it, it, I, I, I see the list, but understanding why you need to do it beyond a program reason is is not at all clear. Because, I mean, if, if it's not a program reason, then there's no real reason to do it perhaps there's a whole number of reasons for example you know if we're doing a gas diversion and, and we need to switch gas from one system to another clearly that's a really significant thing to cut off a major gas supply and the same goes for an electricity supply okay. and therefore we would need to do that in as fast a time period as possible to reduce uh, the disruption to um, some fairly significant end users including a lot of the population of Thurrock um, so that is another reason why we need to do 24 seven. There are a couple of sites where we need to do 24 seven during construction. Again, these relate to smaller directional drilling jobs that we need to undertake, where again, we need to do 24 seven operations because of the nature of the works that we're doing. There aren't any which are driven by program only by the uh, need to reduce the impact on other people or because they need to be done because the nature of the works requires them to be doesn't require that I, I would say it doesn't require them to be 24 7 it requires them to be continuous until they're complete okay well if if i mean there's a number of questions from laura about this so in your written response maybe you could just take us through those reasons that'd be helpful i'm not proposing to provide a a, a detailed list of every works um because it would be extensive, complex and difficult to understand. I'm, I'm proposing to undertake a workshop with council officers to give you the comfort that you understand the nature of the works. OK, um, OK, it's it's difficult to fit that in before we actually make our um, response to your consultation, because, you know, we're trying our best to fit it in in the short time available. Um, so that may have to wait until we've actually got the response. So we may put some questions in there in the response. That's fine. I think what it is, Tim, when I hear 24-7, I think literally 24-7, um, e.g. 365 days a year, potentially, that there could be noise or vibration in a certain area. So if you're saying it's it's a caveat almost of 24-7 as and when it's required to fulfill a certain task in the project like utility or road or rail connection and then the rest of the time it's going to be very normal sort of site working hours so to speak I think that would help put a lot of people's minds at rest okay I'll take that back I hear what you're saying and uh, I'll talk to the team appreciate that and and, and just in terms of noise and, and vibration I, I'm not an expert on these things residents are not an expert It'd be useful if we had some sort of way to say what does an extra five decibel sound like almost um, so we have provided in the uh, ward summary documents um, a, a rather nice graphic which uh, i hope it still has the trombone in um, that sets out for each uh, decibels what an indication of the overall noise 
So you'll be able to view from that, you know, what is the difference between the 60 decibel and the 65 decibel? What does that actually mean for you? Okay, thank you. Yeah, it doesn't a... include the trombone. I'll be disappointed. It, uh, it doesn't. Yes, it does have the trombone. You're right. Um, but um, I think the, the point that Council was trying to get to was the fact that sometimes a 3 dB increase could actually mean a doubling of the sound. Now, I know it's technical, but it's simple examples like that that can help understand what's going on. I think Councillor Muldoni has a question as well. See if we... Yeah, I mean, I think sort of five, three to five decibels during the day is very different to three to five decibels at night. I mean, I don't know. I've never actually lived next to a construction site, but I have spoken to others who have. Um, and for that to be going on 24-7 for any period of time, I mean, how are people supposed to sleep, get up for work the next morning, go to work? It's not good. Anyway, hidden, hidden, deeply buried within the interactive map, I did find quite a few substantial areas of 24-7 working um, near Chadwell. So there's the one where you're building the bridge, the Brentwood Road Bridge. Um, that extends right down to right down Brentwood Road into Godman Road. So if I can have an idea of how long that's going to go on, I've got lots of residents who are concerned about that. Then there's a whole, obviously that big junction uh, that's the A13 and the A1089 um, junction. Um, there's going to be huge amounts of 24-7 working all the way through that junction from your interactive map. Um, and then going down the A1089, there's a number of areas of 24-7 working that will be re required, which I'm presuming are these bridges that you're building over the A1089. Um, I presume that that's what that's about. Um, I'd love to get more detail on how long. I mean, how long? This compound, the Brentwood Road compound, looks as if it's... It's going to be, that would have to be 24-7, obviously. Um, is that going to be 24-7 for long periods of time? Surely it's going to take quite a while to build that bridge. You may not be able to come back to me today, I understand, but I'd really, really like that if you can come back to me in writing. I'll take that back. Sorry, your, your mic cut out at the point where you listed the compound that you were specifically interested in. Could uh, you tell me which one that was again? The Brentwood Road compound. Brentwood yeah. Road, yeah. Thanks. So there I'll take that away to the team. Yeah, if you could come, that'd be fantastic. There is another question, Councillor Chuckworth. Um, actually, um, I live very close to... Um, I live in Godman Road, and uh, kind of I'm um, concerned about the noise and uh, the vibration. Actually, because um, I would like to know more. You know, how um, how is it going to affect me and my community? Actually, I'm quite concerned about that. The noise level. Thank. You. So. I can't go into specific individual locations here. Um, obviously, I don't have the material in front of me. What, I, or, or you know, like I say, I, it would be a distraction. What I suggest is, if you either go along to one of our events, or if you want to call our contact line, you can be put in touch with one of our specialists who'll be able to answer your questions about the direct local impacts on you. And the same goes for any of uh, residents who are watching this, or or wider communities. Who, who want to understand the impact. Um, when you want to understand the impacts on you, I really strongly recommend you either attend one of our events or you uh, go online, have a look at our materials there or call our number, uh, which then will direct you through to a specialist and you can make an appointment to ask any particular individual concerns. Is that okay? Okay, for now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Chris, uh, I was I was going through a number of questions when you uh, you asked for a clarification. So if I just list out the other questions that I think we've covered, uh, why is our 24 seven elements being detailed as new in the consultation? If it's something that would already have been happening for reasons of safety and and so on. And I think I've outlined that that is essentially because we're providing more detail uh, and, and setting out being more explicit about the locations of those works. That was part of the feedback we received that the community needed to understand more in more detail the local impacts on them. So that's why we're setting them out here. And then what protections will be in place to stop Highways England working 24 seven just to speed things up where it suits them. Um, I think we touched on that. That's broadly because the the require the the areas in which we can carry out 24/7 are controlled by the code of construction practice. Um, we'll have to seek consent with the uh, local authority, and so obviously the reason for that 24/7 would be a matter of consideration for the local authority as they provided that consent to us. Um, there may be specified cases where works outside of these hours are required to respond to an emergency or it would be unsafe to stop the works. And in that instance, the relevant local authority would be informed as soon as reasonably possible. But we hope those are few and far between. They really are emergency works only are required for that. The final category that I bring up is um, for vehicle deliveries classified as a normal load or require a police escort, there may also be out of hours works for that. For example, delivery of a tunnel boring machine to site. Um, th those transfers can be quite slow uh, and therefore cause disruption on the road network if they're not managed carefully. And again, if we have those which are going to be few and far between, but they will exist, um, then the hours of those are, are again subject to agreement with the local authorities. Uh, and we would also have to work with the police on those matters. I think that covers the 24-7 questions. Are there any more questions on 24-7 working? Just one from me, Tim. Um, looking through the ward summaries, um, there is a section um, in each of the ward summaries on noise and vibration, um, section subsection 7 in most cases, and it does have a short section on 24-hour construction working. What it doesn't have, and what I was expecting to find here, would be a list of the works in that ward that you're intending to do um, for 24 seven. Um, so where where would that be found? It would depend on which ward summary you're looking at for one thing. I mean, it, it is different for others, but yeah. uh, you know, we do set out the locations rather than the purpose in the most part. Okay. Um, it's pretty general. I think, I think it's in the COCP. Yeah, the code it's of construction it's practice. practice. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. It's just that the you know twenty four hour working is something that might well impact local residents in their ward, and yet the details of it aren't really there for them to check and look at. We set it out in a number of places, so uh, I think I'll leave that there. Don't any think, more uh, questions, Chair? I don't think there's any further in the chamber. Just one uh, brief one. If um, there was a breach in, in working hours, say, on a, a site which is not 24-7, what is the, the usual sort of industry procedure? Would there be maybe perhaps a fine if it's a, um, a serious enough breach of working hours? So in the first intervention would be a stop works from the local authority. And uh, if we were in breach, uh, we would be instructed to stop works by the local authority, which we would have to do. There, there is some detail about that's how, how that's handled under the um, Control of Pollution Act, but also amendments that are made to it through the development consent order. That's quite a detailed matter, and I would have to come back to you in writing on that. If you could, that would be fantastic. Uh, I think that's it for question 10, I believe that was. Or I think you might have done a few at once, so if you could let us know. what I, I think I've jumped through all of the 24-7. If So um, if we can have all questions on 24-7 noise, or we'll move to the one on um, cross-sections of the bridges. I 
think you can safely move on to, over to the cross sections. I'm going to punt this one in your direction, Gary, um, so that I can take a breather. <laughs> I mean, this this one actually is uh, is a very long question, but it's based on a presentation that we gave at the task force, and it was um, some cross sections that were shown, and there was a, I think a bit of a misunderstanding on what the cross sections uh, had on them. So the the images shown on the presentation on, and it was on page 12 of 41, are are illustrative, but they are the same as the cross sections of the bridges in the current scheme. There's no difference between what we showed on those illustrative figures in the presented to the task force. And it was particularly North Road that, that, that uh, we were looking at. And uh, there, were, there were images of people at the edge on these, these illustrative cross sections, which are for maintenance purpose only. They're not, not footpaths and they're not uh, supposed to be, and they will be controlled uh, when we do the detailed design, there will be uh, ways that we'll, we'll block them off to, for public use, but they're there primarily for maintenance purposes. So there, there, there will be a, a pedestrian cycleway on the east side of North Road, which was one of the queries that came up, and we will um, connect that up to uh, a new footpath that we've got uh, north of the, the crossing of North Road, and the, there's there's a there's an extension to that footpath that goes footpath like where it goes to the to the east and also one that goes to the west. The the one that goes to the west crosses the the North Road. Now we we are currently um, working with uh, Ferric officers to to look at the 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 actual uh, the whole of the the prefer the public rights of way strategy. And we want to look at to determine what the possible future uses of networks to identify locations where might benefit from a control crossing. So that is potentially one location where it might be that we would we would add in a control crossing. So I think you know we we are as I say we're working with with uh, Thurrock officers to to look at that location. So I think that covers the the particular question on the query on the on that particular um, crossing. If I can just add to that, um, councillors, um, uh, Gary's right, we are talking um, and we're not quite there yet, but ra rather than focus on a particular crossing like North Road, um, it's likely that the widths of all the crossings, um, the actual full width, is adequate. What we're discussing with Highways England is how that width is utilised. Um, and right now they've got a shared cycle pedestrian route in most cases. Um, and we're thinking about segregated routes because that follows DFT guidance, um, which may mean a slight adjustment to the way space is allocated on each bridge. So it may eat into either the highway or the verge um, in order to create the extra width um, for the simple reason that whilst um, pedestrian and cycle routes may not be very well used on those crossings right now, um, there is an active travel strategy that Thurrock is promoting and it itself will be following this other guidance. And if if in fact we don't get those uh, that guidance complied with, it's possible that we might have some funding difficulties with providing some of these footpaths and cycleways in the future. And they would then become a bit of a bottleneck to uh, what we hope to be uh, much improved use. Um, so those discussions are ongoing um, and we'll see where we get. Thanks, Chris, for clarifying that. I'll just see if there's any questions in the chamber. No questions. Sorry, Tim, I think you're on mute. I'm, go I'm going to throw the next two at you as well, I think. Um, if that's OK, can you pick those two up? Yeah, sure. Um, so the next one is um, on the topic of public rights away. Could Highways England also please clarify how they can, uh, sorry, how they can call the southern end of the Rectory Road 
in Orsett Cop, a new prow uh, in consultation material. I'll just touch on that one first. I think it's, a, it's slightly, most probably misunderstanding of within the ward summaries, there's a, in the legend, there's a, an orange dotted line which shows uh, it, it isn't only related to uh, a new um, footpath, it's also upgraded footpaths. And in this particular location, what we're doing is we're, we actually are replacing Rectory Road Bridge. And we've, we see this as an, an important missing link in the equestrian network, um, as the existing Rectory Road Bridge is not designed for equestrian standards. So the, what the dotted line on the, on the ward summaries is showing is that we're upgrading that particular crossing. So I think that's where, where the misunderstanding has come in. So we, we are actually providing um, an, an, uh, an equestrian crossing across Rectory Road Bridge, other than just a, a cycleway and footway. So it will become, um, the, this route also connects to, will also connect actually to a Pegasus crossing that goes over the uh, A1013 and, and onto footpath 79 which will also be upgraded to a bridleway. So what we're doing is we're completing a bridleway um, route through that area. The, the second part of this relates to um, what was shown as the existing uh, footpath along the A1013. A uh, A1 now, I think on our interactive plans, I think what happens is the, the actual route of that actually is, is shown in a in a, a, a slightly different location, that will be replaced anyway. We were putting a new one to the to the south of the 10, 10 13. So I, what I can do is apologize if there's any confusion arise because of that. Um, however, the, the alignment of the proposed route is is correct and shown on the south of the, the A1013. And we'll be widening the route here to meet the current standards. This is in line with latest government policy to improve active travel op options. So that's one of the, what we'll be doing on that particular. I don't think there's anything else on that was, was asked. No, I think that's all that's on that particular question. So just just for members benefit in the ward summaries, the fifth subsection of every single ward summary contains full details of all the public rights of way, alterations, diversions, closures. Um, in some wards there are none, but um, there are in most, there's about five or six wards where they do occur. So it's worth looking at that part of the ward summary. Yeah, thanks Chris. And, that, and I think that's also where there's been a bit of confusion earlier about what the traffic management section is and what the footpath sections so it is consistent as you say um the the next one is uh, also why would there not be an M nmu route on the section of ltc between the a13 and a127 uh, if highways england truly want to do the right thing for nmus after all it would not be a motorway or join motorways so I think on so, this one. Sorry, Gary, just before you go into that, just for the benefit of um, anyone that's watching in, could you just give the abbreviation MMU? What does it, what does it stand for, please? Sorry. I... MMU. NMU, just... NMU stands for non-motorised okay. users. It's footpaths, cycleways and horse riding routes, which have now been re-termed which are walking, cycling and horse riders. Sorry. <laughs> no, thanks. Thanks, Ken. Chris, that's uh, yes, very useful. Thanks. And in fact, it, I mean, in our, our our response is that you know um, we are increasing the provision of bridleways, which which can be used by cyclists along the LTC route, but we are not providing a segregated route between the A13 to the A127, as we we don't break that link actually. So we're not looking at at, uh, at providing that. But um, this is a, primarily because our research shows that the there would be more demand for east-west routes connecting urban areas and for recreational routes rather than a, a north-south route connecting connecting trunk, trunk roads. Um, it is not seen as a safe way to provide a, a Witcher route through the... Oh, sorry, there's another, another question here which goes on to ask about, um, in a similar vein, 
why do Highways England keep refusing to incorporate a, a Witcher route cycle service on the LTC for the tunnel as they do, do uh, the current crossing? The tunnel portal would be a, amongst a new park, so surely it would be it wouldn't be difficult to incorporate a safe passage for cyclists to use a similar service as at the current crossing via a park and tunnel serv service road. Now, on this one, um, it's it's not seen as a safe way to provide a witcher route through the tunnel alongside a, a trunk road. I mean, obviously, if you've got fast moving traffic, you don't want to mix that with uh, um, with cyclists or pedestrians. Um, it is also not seen as a safe safe to make use of the service area beneath the carriageway. So there will be quite a large area underneath the the, the tunnel, which um, but it's it's it one of the re one of the reasons is we are putting other equipment down there. But it's also that it would be difficult um, if you had to evacuate anybody from in those areas because there's no connection between that le that particular level and the road level so it would be at either end um, so it's not seen as a practical way of actually doing it um, and one of the things that uh, it, it's also going you know the location of the portals might not be the best places for for cyclists to actually go to to cross so the the ferry is is at a location that is more central and would find provide a a safer crossing so it's really looking at actually how how that's that is used to its best advantage just a, Thanks, a, a question there gary so what what would happen if i was to cycle up to the um to dartford the dartford the, the, the legacy dartford crossing how would a, a cyclist get across at the moment Um, I'd, I'd, I'm, I'd have to come back to you on that. I mean, I know there was a there was a um, uh, a shuttle service provided, which used. I mean, it started off many years ago as a as a London bus, but um, it's the, the and then it it uh, was a it was a transit van. So you'd cycle to a, a particular location, and that transit van would put your bikes on the back and and transport you through. I'm not sure on how um, how frequently that's been used recently. So the, what I what I'll do is I'll, I'll I'll find out unless unless Tim knows a bit more about that one. I, d I don't know the frequency of use, but you can. So currently, what happens is that you'd uh, arrive at the um, point either in Essex or Kent, um, and you contact. I've got the website open, so you have to phone a phone number. Uh, and they come out essentially with a vehicle with a bike rack on it. Um, it's only suitable for uh, bikes that were fit on a bike rack, so you can't use it if you've got a trailer or a tandem, uh, and they'll load you onto a bike rack and drive you off and drop you off on the other side. Um, so that's what happens at the moment um, at Dartford. It usually takes, sorry, I'm just literally reading it off, takes 15 minutes for the lift to arrive after you've called to request a pickup, and it can take longer at rush hour or if there's a traffic jam. I think the core bit here is actually, you know, Thurrock has very good connection for cyclists across uh, via the ferry. And, and that's a very appropriate and sensible means for people to cross the river. And, um, you know, we support that ferry being in place and continuing to provide its service. So it's not, it's not something you're looking into at the moment to... Um, add to the current plans and proposals, or is it maybe perhaps something that could be investigated further down the line? It's not something that we're currently considering. Uh, we, we think that the ferry provides the best service and, and that there isn't the need for a crossing at this location to, to add and supplement to the crossings that are already provided. We're much more focused on, and, and you know, the active travel agenda is really important. We've heard a lot of discussion about what we are doing and we're much more focused at connecting the communities that um, uh, are sort of situated north of or south of the river. Councillor Muldoni has a question. Thank you, yeah. Going back to public rights of way and obviously in Chadwell we've got, we've got footpaths that are going to be closed for years at a time um, as well as the other ones that we discussed earlier. 
Um, some of them are going to be upgraded to bridal ways, I believe. Just to, are you looking at target hardening or are you having conversations about target hardening? Because um, I'm sure this is not just contained, you know, this isn't just restricted to Chadwell, but we've got huge problems with antisocial behaviour from um, motorcycle riders and quad bikes um, that use some of these pathways to get onto the heath. Um, so will there be, is there any plans for target hardening, uh, particularly on the ones on the pathways that are being upgraded to bridal ways? Um, because obviously that that can open, you know, I can see that there's going to be a potential huge impact on antisocial behaviour that we're trying very hard to address at the moment and having a little bit of success this summer. Is that one you can get, Gary, or do you want me to? You, I mean, the, I mean, all I'd say to that is obviously we'd look at the detail of the, you know, how we we sort of prevent uh, certain vehicles using. Um, whether they're bridal ways or whatever, when we go to the detailed design stage. Um, but uh, I think, you know, that that is something for a for a for a later discussion. Yeah, that's broadly what I was going to say. I mean, th these matters. So we are required to set out a landscaping plan, which would include information about the public rights way, and and that will be considered, reviewed, and approved. And um, as part of that discussion. It will be sensible to have a, a discussion about detailed design matters like target hardening. I do understand the concern. It's early in the program for us to be doing that. That you know uh, that the level of design comes later in the stage, but um, making sure it's a consideration is a serious matter. Um, so again, um, Chris, perhaps that's a discussion we can have. Sure. Yep. Thank you. Don't think there's any further questions on that one. Okay, um, I'm running through. Now, uh, I have at the end of this a, a question that was not raised earlier. It was actually from the last task force, a uh, question from Councillor Muldoney, uh, which we said we'd come back in writing. I understand we haven't done, so I'll give it here, and uh, then you know it'll follow up in the written answers, uh, which is what is the cost saving of removing the rest and service area? Uh, that was raised at the last session, and and the answer is that there was no measurable cost saving of removing the rest and service area. The proposal was to acquire the land, which we need for construction anyway, and to secure an outline consent for it. It would then be for a developer to bring forward their detailed plans, and the developer would de deliver the facility. So uh, at the end of the day, it, it wasn't a significant and, and, and unique item inside of our cost plan and not something that could be broken out. The drivers for removing the rest and service area weren't financial, which I think we reported last time. They focused on uh, the feedback from Thurrock Council on, on the appropriateness of a service area at that location. Public feedback from local residents who strongly did not want a rest and service area at that location. And also some concerns about the consentability. The site was in the green belt and, and there were a number of concerns that we had to address if we were to take it forward for consent. And, and given the strength of feeling from both Thurrock Council and the local residents, we, we declined to take it forward. Um, we'll put that in our written responses. Um, I don't know Tim, if there's any you, questions on that. that. When you do that, um, perhaps you could bear in mind that when you remove the, re the rest and service area, um, you also removed um, the junction. And the junction and the approach road into the rest and service area and the maintenance depot would have been a cost saving, surely. Perhaps you could bear that in mind when you respond. I'll take that on board and consider it, Chris. So no. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that it adds value to sit there and break down the historic cost decisions that have been made on the project rather than look at the, the, the scheme that's in front of us at this point in time. No, sure. But if, if you're responding to Councillor's question and you're saying there's no cost saving when in fact the junction was removed because it was no longer necessary to access that, 
then that's surely a cost saving and that should be brought into your answer, surely. Like I say, I'll work with the team to have another look based on what you're suggesting. It's a bit of an aggregate on top of the rest and service area, but it's a valid point. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't believe or there is. Or I go to round two? No further questions at the moment. You may be relieved to know that there's only seven, uh, no, eight questions, I believe, in round two. Nine, nine, Tim. Are there nine? Yeah. Oh, there's yeah, I seem to have two counts. question ones. Yes, two question ones. Well, one, <laughs> one from one person and the other eight are from somebody else. <laughs> so a question from Councillor Gary Byrne. Please explain what is happening at the Orsitcock underpass. Will there be two or three lanes? Will this create a bottleneck? I think, Gary, were you going to pick this one up? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, on uh, I think what we're talking about here is actually where the A13 connect, connects to the section from Orsitcock roundabout join the Manor Way section. So you're, there's three lanes being built currently, obviously, by Thurrock. And we, we would propose that those those three lanes continue underneath the Orsitcock roundabout. That although there is a section just to the to the east, sorry, to the west of Orsitcock roundabout on the A13 and between the 1089 junction, where we will reduce the uh, A13 down to two lanes, where the Lower Thames crossing comes come takes a slip roads off and then rejoins so you get a lane drop and a lane gain and it will be set the same on both the the westbound carriageway and the eastbound carriageway and this obviously is all being designed to meet the traffic flows that, that use that particular section of the road because in fact what happens is if you're going towards towards london um you go underneath the Orsitcock roundabout and in fact we we do widen out to four lanes and so there's a two lane drop and a two lane straight on because the amount of traffic that comes off that wants to either go northbound on LTC, southbound on LTC or onto the 1089 will come off come off at that location whilst the the traffic coming on from the Orsitcock roundabout will rejoin again and you'll get the three lanes back which continue through. So it is only over that section where we reduce the the actual uh, A13 to two lanes. And it will be the same on the on the uh, eastbound section where traffic is coming off to go on to uh, the Orsitcock roundabout. There will be a lane drop and there will be a lane gain where the LTC traffic rejoins the A13 um, before it goes underneath the Orsitcock junction. Do you know ha roughly how long the two lane sections uh, west and east are? Um, I, I ish, was going to scale them off. I think is, they're most, it, probably. Is it 100 yards? Is it 500? No, no, no. It, it's mostly about 600 metres, I would have thought. Okay. I can, okay. I, I can, I can get that for you, Chris. That's no, no, it's, it's okay. It's fine. It's fine. Thank you. Any questions from anyone? Any questions? Well, just that is a that was a yes. Then there's a two lane bottleneck, yes, or a possible potential two lane bottleneck. Sorry, no. I mean the, the thing is we've designed it to the traffic flows that we've we've got. We've all you've also um, where you have a diverge, the standards show that you have to have a, a a a lane a lane drop at that particular location because. Of the through traffic and the traffic wants to come off so all we've done is we've just followed standard and it is common practice um, at junctions that you have a, a lane drop and in fact if you look at the main lower thames crossing underneath the a13 you get the same you get two so if you're coming northbound where we're coming off at the a13 there is a lane drop um, and so there's two lanes until it picks up the traffic coming either from the 1089 or from A13, A13 um, westbound, and the same on the southbound section there, and they are actually a little bit longer length than I think the northbound one. I can't remember how long it is, but it might might be even a kilometre of two lane. But uh, the it, whereas the southbound isn't quite as long, or it might be the other way around. I can't remember. But there are there are sections of two lane. I mean, 
coming southbound from the A, uh, the M25, that, that is two lanes anyway. So that just continues through as two lanes until it, it meets the, the lane gain from the A13 either eastbound. Councillor Pickler has a question. Yeah, just <clears throat> to clarify something you're saying. So basically you're saying that Thurrock Council have just wasted tens of millions of pounds widening the A13 from the runaway flyover down to the opposite cock because once it gets there, you're going to put it all back to two lanes again. So they, it would have been far better for Thurrock Council not to actually widen that bit of the A13. That's what you're saying. So what you're actually doing is undoing all the work that we've done to try and ease the congestion on the A13 and now creating the bottleneck that there was there in the first place. Can I, can I just come back on that? No, no we're, not, we're not touching the section between the Orsicock roundabout and Manor Way. That bit will remain at three lanes because um, what, one thing we do do is actually, you know, th there's, that needs to be three lanes. So, which is, you know, which, which you know, you can see Thurrock have actually just recently um, Sorry, Gary. two, three lanes. It's the section Gary? between... Sorry to interrupt, I've kept down to pick I just wanted to come in. Yeah, no, so you, you misunderstood what I said. I know that section is remaining at three lanes. What I'm saying is, to me, that is pointless if you're then going to bottom it back to two lanes again when it gets to the opposite cock. So the money that's just been spent on making it three lanes all the way through is now going to finish when it gets to the opposite cock roundabout because it's going to be back down to two lanes for 600 metres or 800 metres. So uh, I just can't see the sense behind it. It seems absolutely ludicrous to me. Can I, can I just come, come back again just to, just to try and help clarify that? that one, of, one of the big benefits that Lower Thames Crossing has is that where it connects to the A13, from that particular lo location through to Junction 30, uh, there's a reduction in traffic. So, and what, what, you're, what we're doing is we're literally, it's only as you're going through the short section where you're taking a slip road on and a slip road off. So it's not it's, it's not causing a bottleneck at all. It's just that's the volume of traffic that uh, the traffic model is predicting to go through those those locations. Can I, uh, Gary, just to uh, help the councillor find the information? If you go to the operations update, Figure 415, which is on page 148, sets out the traffic volumes as a percentage of road capacity. Um, and the PM peak in 2029 without the uh, project. And uh, figure 416 on the next page, 149 sets it out with the project. And you can see there illustrated what Gary's describing, which is that uh, yes, without the project, there is congestion along that stretch of the road. But once LTC is constructed, because of the changes in traffic movements across the area, there is no longer congestion along that stretch of the road. And, and that's shown in all of our traffic modelling that, that we do relieve congestion to the west of the Orsett Jockcock Junction and that the capacity there is sufficient and won't create a um, bottleneck. Tim, those, those um, diagrams, I'm just looking at them, they're for the 2029. What happens in 2051 or 2042? Is it shown as um, a congested area later down the line after opening? I'd have to come back to you on the flows at 2044. 2044, okay, fine. 2044 just, is the relevant is the design year. Yeah, the, um, yeah, it's just that the ones you just quoted are literally at opening. Yeah. Um, and so fair enough, but you know, 10, 15 years down the line, be interesting to see what happens. So if you could include that in your response, that'd be helpful. I'm sure it's in there somewhere. Okay, any more questions on that one? Um, just before we move on to more questions, I'm just looking at the time. Um, I'd like to move a motion without notice to spend Council Procedure Rule 11.1 to allow the meeting to continue beyond the two and a half hour time limit. I suspect we'll need around another 30 minutes or so. Is that seconded? Seconded. Thank you. I don't 
but to see if there's any other questions related to the last one. Don't look around the chamber, I don't think there is, so please move on. Okay, the next question came from Robert Quick, resident representative. Um, and I think we've answered some of this already, but I'll, I'll recap. Um, there have been varying numbers of workers mentioned in connection with the project. Can you clarify A, numbers as they'll be spread along the route, B, numbers, how will they be spread through the construction phase, and C, how will the project accommodate them over the lifespan of the construction period? So to hit A and B together, um, we, we anticipate that the Lower Thames Crossing will support 22,000 jobs over the course of delivery. As I've said previously, we don't break that down by either area or phase, though I note the question on area, and I will take that back and talk to the team. Area may be more plausible for us to look at than, uh, than phasing. At its peak, we expect the total to be around 10,000 jobs. And obviously, this will go up and down through the period, and then some uh, roles may change, but uh, people might work more than one job as they work through that period and it changes over time. So it's, it, it is very much an estimate and, a, and, a, and an understanding of what is likely to happen. We certainly don't have detailed forecasts of exactly what work crews will be required across the piece, and that'll be uh, needing the contractor to work that out at a future date. So it is only given an indication at this point. Tim. Could I just ask there, um, you may not have included it in the consultation material, but each each of the 18 or 19 compounds that you have throughout the route, um, you have done, I've, I've seen somewhere, some estimates of workers per compound. These are just purely construction workers working on the site as opposed to the 22,000, which is obviously office workers and everything else. Um, is it possible to to when you come back to us with the written answer that you could direct us to where that original information was. I just, I, I've seen it, I just can't remember where. Yeah, um, I'll take a look at that and see if we can do that. If, it, if it's there, then absolutely we'll signpost you to it. Um, it may be that that is our back working to inform the information we set out in terms of the number of travels and the number of trips. Um, and in order to be able to help understand the nature of the works at each compound. So if it's in the consultation material, I'll happily share that. I think I think I'm right in thinking that um, out of your 22,000 estimate, the direct construction workers are probably about three or four thousand directly. And what you're talking about is the wider economic impact. That's where, right. Yeah. Where all the supply chain down the line that could be anywhere in the country, you you would use those as, as job counts. Um, office workers in your head office and site offices would also be counted. So actually the 22,000 is quite a large number, whereas the number actually working on the site is considerably smaller. Yes, that's a fair statement. I wouldn't disagree with you there, Chris. Which is where the next sort of uh, piece comes in. And so, we need to look at two things. First of all, where do these workers come from and uh, then how do they get accommodated? So in terms of where do these workers come from, obviously Chris has set out that there'll be a number on site and I talked earlier about the skills and employment strategy and how that'll work to actually try to bring local people actually to work directly on site and directly within our contracts. But we're also working uh, with wider, um, with, with com Excuse me, I'm tripping over my tongue. We're also working across the region with a number of enterprise initiatives to look at uh, bringing on small and medium enterprises from across the region. So we've got a supply chain directory, which we're already encouraging suppliers to sign up to. And uh, we've got a number of suppliers from uh, Thurrock and, and from the other local authorities who are signing up to this. And they'll be provided with direct information on exactly what contracts are being let in the area and how they can support the works going on in the area. That might be material supplies. It could be all sorts of different activities that, that sit in the supply chain, if, if not actual physical works on site itself. And 
um, we're also working through that to offer training to local businesses so that we any any local businesses will be we will work with them to make sure that they have the skills to be able to get in on the project you know we have to follow procurement rules in order to bring projects on we'll be working with local businesses so they understand the procurement rules and how they can engage with our contracting mechanisms to get their get roles uh, to get to get service and and to get jobs um, to, for their companies to get business in delivery of the program. Next question in the same space. So this isn't the next question. This is the next part of that question. Is how do we actually accommodate them over the life cycle of the construction period? So we've worked up an accommodation strategy that looks at the availability of accommodation in the region. Our priority, first of all, is going to be to bring workers in from the local area. And, and obviously, if they're coming in from the local area, they'll live locally. And, and that's the easiest answer all round. But there will be workers that need to come into the area to work. Uh, so we have an accommodation strategy. We've looked at the capacity of accommodation across the region. And uh, we are also proposing to put in place uh, some temporary accommodation. So the North Portal site will be putting in 400 temporary accommodation, um, essentially a uh, hotel room type scenario for temporary workers to supplement the local housing capacity. And then the final picture of that is quite specialist. Uh, we will have tunnels working below ground in high pressure environments and they need a place to go and rest between their shifts. And because of the high pressure environment, they need specialist accommodation that allows them to safely come out of the tunnel to rest and then and then go back in on the next shift. So we provide in te 80 temporary accommodation as well to support the tunnel operations. Any questions on that? We did cover this in the previous task force meeting, so I think um, there's no questions on that particular question from the Chamber. Okay. So the next question, how will residents along the proposed route know what design standards the contractors have to meet to control noise, light emissions, uh, impacts both during construction and afterwards? Additionally, how will residents be made aware of actual performance on these measurements versus the standards? So we place significant controls on our on our contractors in terms of design, in terms of construction, and uh, how the scheme will operate. Uh, these are set out in the DCO and in our control documents, and they will be publicly available. Now, many of those require us to then set out further detailed information. For example, the code of construction practice, which will be a core piece of information, then sets out a requirement that our contractors deliver environmental management plans, which set out a lot more detail on the exact requirements and the standards. That'll be consulted through Thurrock Council before sign off by the Secretary of State, uh, and that's required before our contractors can start their works. Now, Within, we're required to stay within that. We will uh, monitor and police our contractors to ensure they remain with that and take appropriate action to maintain compliance. But I think what really answers the question is that all of those documents that our contractors are required to prepare and that require approval, we are further required to publicize them. Uh, we will maintain an electronic register is the legal phrasing used, but effectively that means if you go to our website, you'll be able to access all of these documents to see exactly what the contractors are committed to and read for yourself exactly what the requirements are. And that includes details of the monitoring and auditing program that our contractors will use to confirm their compliance. Highways England and our representatives will be carrying out site inspections and audits. And on request, uh, the local authorities, the Environment Agency and Natural England will be given access to the results of site inspections and audits, along with the opportunity to attend and observe Highways England site inspections and audits. In terms of general communication, I mean, pointing to the control documents gives a very specific answer that was requested. But we're mindful that that's a challenge for a lot of people to engage with. So we're putting in place a community engagement uh, program 
where we'll have people who set with the uh, local communities and talk to them about the works, advise them in advance of the works of the nature, how long it'll take, how hours we're working and what, they're, what they can expect to see during the works. We'll also notify people as appropriate through various channels, letter drops, posters, social media and email. And we'll put in a number of mechanisms for residents to find out more. So community phone lines, email, uh, correspondence address and community drop in sessions and so on. Everything that you'd expect to see on a major construction programme of this nature. We'll also communicate this to other key stakeholders such as Thurrock Council, community groups and groups such as Thames Crossing Action Group so that they can let people know through their networks about what is going on. All of our contractors are going to be required to sign up to considerate contractor scheme, which is a, a long last, a long lived uh, scheme industry wide of best practice that mandates good communication with the local authorities. We have any more questions on that? Councillor Muldon, he has a question. It kind of might sit here, or um, I'll ask it as a standalone question. So I think last meeting I brought up the fact that 10% of the adult population is digitally excluded. You just reminded me of it, saying that you can have your COCP online. Um, so the question I asked, I don't believe reading the minutes actually got an answer to it, is how have you been, what have you been doing to reach hard to, to reach groups? So for example, um, those people who are digitally excluded. Um, I've had a, a number of residents who's actually, who have English as a second language, so I can't even, you know, their, their English wasn't good enough that I can communicate with them. Have you got any interpreters um, that they can speak to? They want to understand what's going on with the road, but um, at the moment they're excluded from the consultation. Um, and other groups that are traditionally difficult to reach okay i'm just uh on i've just asked for somebody to uh, let me know um some uh, information on that but overall um we recognize that some people are digitally excluded so we have followed the normal procedures of putting information into newspapers, which is a normal way of notifying people. We've also done a substantial letter drop across the region. I, I couldn't give you the exact numbers of letters, uh, leaflets that we've distributed across the area to bring people's attention to uh, the consultation, let them know that they can order materials directly to their home or direct them to events or to the phone line all of which support uh, digitally excluded uh, individuals. The question I've asked on, um, and I would like to get an answer, but I may have to come back to you, is on the foreign language and how we've uh, notified people in foreign language. Um, it's coming through. Uh, we do translate materials on request. So if we have any requests for translation, um, then we do provide that. And. Uh, Um, who would I send that request to? Sorry, send the request for... Um, translation and materials. Okay, uh, you can go direct to our email or to our phone... No, sorry, I'll direct you to our phone number. And if you contact our phone number, that'll go uh, through uh, to the proper process for requesting. And... Um, uh, if somebody can put the phone number for me in the discussion from my team, then I'll read out the phone number so that you can have it. Um, that Thank might take you. a moment, so okay. I suggest we come back to that. Thank you. Just looking around the room, I don't think there's any further questions on that one, just the phone number to follow. Oh, sorry. I mean, it's okay having the materials trans translated, but if residents have then got questions about it can they who can they, can they talk to you have you got any interpretation facilities I mean, it's one thing you know <laughs> you've seen by the amount of questions tonight it's yeah you know people are going to have think, questions are, think, can, can they be accommodated 
if, if that request gets put to us, then then we'll certainly look at it. Um, and, uh, you know, just to flag, we've got British sign languages on. I think in principle, there's no reason why we can't arrange a translator to to help a specific um, person or community. I mean, uh, I was aware I was uh, involved at a previous consultation event where we got a British sign language interpreter and we brought a group of people together. Um, so they asked me questions, I answered the questions and the sign language interpreter uh, did that for us. I don't see any reason why we couldn't do that. We would need to understand what the need was, what the language was and uh, look at how we could do it most effectively. But in principle, I don't see a problem with that if we can formulate the request together. Thank you. Um, I have the number. It is 03001235000. And if there is a specific request um, in relation to a need for a translator, I think probably the easiest answer is to look at uh, an event and, and see what we can do. I suggest uh, flagging that to Chris, if I can ask you to help us, please, um, to understand what, what the language would be needed and what the event. And uh, we can then look at what we can do if we can channel that through you, Chris. That might yeah, be easiest. Yeah. Um, Councillor, if, if you channel any specific requests about language or event locations, could you send it to Lucy and she can forward it on and then I can get an answer to you? Yes, so we'll do that. Thanks, Chris. Okay, looking around the chamber, I think you can um, carry on to the next question. Okay. Um, so we've uh, this is another question. We've questioned at various meetings with Highways England our concern on both the choice of reflective sound barriers, fences, over modern absorbing material, and the choice of clean root shrubs and trees over bigger, faster growing varieties. If your chosen materials do not perform satisfactorily, what follow up will residents have to correct the situation? So we've ensured that suitable measures are in place to mitigate the road's impact on noise pollution. Uh, so we use low, no, not ro low noise road surfacing and where additional mitigations considered necessary, noise barriers along uh, the carriageway have been specified. These barriers, the noise assessments have shown uh, would reduce noise and, and vibration impacts on the road of the road once open. The heights and locations of those have been determined through modelling that's generated, and that accounts for the type and the nature of the barriers that we're proposing to put in place. So what I'm saying there is that our assessments have shown that the noise barriers that we are proposing are appropriate and suitable. Those noise barriers will be designed and installed according to uh, standards that set out how they should work and, and, and how they function. So that ensures that they give the performance that's required. Tree planting for the purposes of screen environmental mitigation, not noise mitigation. And the choice of trees for planting is uh, designed to maximize successful establishment. And the choice of species is to ensure they're likely to be adaptive to future climate change scenarios. We've worked on uh, discussion with Forestry England on that. Ideally, we want something that looks as close to native woodland in the area as possible so that it feels like it's part of the scenery. In terms of uh, if they do not perform satisfactorily, so we must be compliant with the DCO and its control documents. And all of these will be set out in the environmental master plan design principles and code of construction practice. If there is a perceived non-compliance, residents should take this up with Highways England and the local authority um, who can review the proposals and, and determine if they're in breach of the conditions. Any questions? I've got a question actually. Um, how, we, how, how will the council read, uh, how will the council find out these noise differences that the barriers are putting in place if, uh, going back, I was trying to find exactly what question it was, probably about 20 questions ago, you said the noise um, the, these remote devices that pick up the noise and, and register it, they're all going to be removed at the end of construction. So how will the council know if the barriers have actually achieved the, the goal put down in the DCO? 
So we wouldn't routinely put in place noise monitoring. Um, there's a lot of factors that can change and vary. And, and as you know, traffic will vary over time as different proposals are brought forward. So uh, that's not normally undertaken to check the uh, condition. Uh, the forecasts are the basis on the assessment and the proposed mitigation is uh, agreed through the examination and uh, implemented on site. It's not normal to then verify after the fact whether that is in place, you know, whether it meets the uh, the expectation. Tim, in the unlikely event that some of these predictions about noise and air quality in the future are not correct, how would you know? I mean, given, given that we've had at least three or four different changing predictions of your traffic, what confidence should we have that the air quality upon opening and the noise upon opening is as predicted into the future? Because you just don't know. You well, think the uncertainty is, 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 you know, there's a lot of uncertainties here, but at the core one you reference there is the traffic. And um, the traffic the associated with the operation of the scheme is is monitored uh, by Highways England after opening. So Highways England produces post opening project evaluation reports one year and five years after the, the opening of a road scheme and a meta report. I, I have to admit, I don't know what meta report is. It's published at two year intervals, taking an overview of all the evaluations to date. So those contain a scheme evaluation table which shows the appraisal, the predicted impact before construction and an evaluation recalculated impact after opening figures for all schemes. And that sets out figures for carbon emissions, traffic levels and accidents. And so at the heart of the air and the noise are the traffic levels. And that will be the mechanism that identifies whether the traffic flows are in accordance with our initial forecasts. OK, it, it, it seems odd that you're going to put, I don't know, 50 or 60 um, monitors up for air quality and noise throughout your six to eight year construction period. Then you're going to take them all down. Why not just leave a few up? <laughs> like I say, we conform to what is normal on a project of this type. Um, and we don't monitor <laughs> afterwards, but uh, uh, the councillor has already asked us to uh, to consider that. And I, I said I would. That's not a commitment to do it, but it is a commitment to take it back to the team and, and take seriously the suggestion of the councillors. Thank you. Any further questions on this one? No. Uh, on to the next question, please. OK. Um, the next question, I think, is uh, back to working hours. The operational hours of the contractors shared during the consultation, uh, is, it's stated they are vague and not explicit. This is not satisfactory. Please share more detail on the operational hours for various segments of the route. So we do set out the standard working hours across the project, which are 7 till 7am uh, 7 till 7pm 7 weekdays. 7 a.m. till 4 p.m. on Saturdays, plus uh, up to one hour before and after for mobilization and shutdown procedures. There'll be variations at different times of construction. So, for example, we have looked for, uh, we are setting out a need for extended working hours for earthworks up to 10 p.m. Monday to Saturday. This is to make the most of the earthwork season and make sure that we do the earthworks as efficiently as we can, which allows us to get on with the rest of the scheme. The working hours change over time as construction activities change and uh, so it wouldn't be possible to set it out in full detail across each area um, because the full level of detail of working hours will be defined by the contractor once they come on board. Um, and I go back to, uh, you know, for all works, the contractor is required to make an application uh, for a Section 61 consent, um, which is uh, through the local authority and any variations to normal or additional working hours will need to be agreed with the local relevant authority in Highways England through the Section 61 process. There are a number of areas where we're proposing 24 hour working and I've already discussed that in some detail previously. 
to see if there's any questions from the Chamber regarding the working hours. No, I think we've got covered those earlier. Thank you. Okay. Um, next question. During the consultation, figures were given for HGV movements for various parts of the construction. It numbered them as round trips, which made the actual numbers quoted seem like half the number. Uh, residents will experience two movements of an HGV going through their area per trip. Please clarify the level of movements is the first part of the question. And what impact, if any, will suggested use of Tilbury to have on juice in HGV movements? So to clarify, um, the HGV numbers shown in our ward summaries refer to the number of vehicles accessing each site. So it is correct to understand that the vehicles will be traveling both to and from the site. This is made clear in the consultation materials, but where we describe 30 vehicles to the construction site, then uh, logically there are uh, 60 in total trips to and from the site. On the use of Port of Tilbury, I think, um, and, and I use Port of Tilbury specifically, uh, accounting for Port of Tilbury and Tilbury too. Um, I answer this question in terms of two material streams, excavated material, a material needed to construct the project, material that could potentially go out and uh, material that needs to come in. In terms of the excavated material, there is a substantial amount of uh, material at the North Portal, the majority of which will come from the tunnelling operation. Our proposals allow for this material to be used in the landscaping proposals across the area, which we've developed in, in discussion with the local landowners. There is some material which may not be suitable for reuse, which we need to be taken off. This is detailed in the materials handling plan, but the majority, the significant majority of materials excavated at the North Portal will be used on site. We have assumed that a certain proportion of materials required for use in constructing the tunnel will also be brought in through the port facilities at Tilbury. And this is built into our assessments and the traffic movements. So we are already accounting for a number of materials to be brought to site through the port of Tilbury. Now that really, that answer has really focused on the North Portal um, in relation to uh, the use of the port of Tilbury. In terms of use of the port of Tilbury for materials elsewhere on the scheme, um, bringing it into the port would then place quite a lot of pressure on the local road network at the port access and potentially not have the outcome that is looked for when we try to use alternatives to road, as in it might put more traffic on congested parts of the road network. Whereas if we're doing works up at the M25, it's more reasonable to bring it in down the M25 or, or via other routes than it is to bring it into Tilbury and run it through Thurrock up to that location. So it will vary depending on where you are on the scheme, how much can reasonably be brought from in through Port of Tilbury. Any questions on that? Just looking around the room, I can't see any. Just one for myself. In regards to um, the, the river, you're, you're literally working right on it. And traditionally, we've had lots of um, small jetties and things like that where industries have um, been placed around um, the River Thames. Is, how much do you think you could put by boat to take more HGVs off the roads and make our local roads safer for existing residents? So we've done what uh, a significant piece of work. We've done everything that we can to make sure that we reuse material. The vast amount of movements associated with a scheme like this is to move materials onto uh, either either move construction materials on site and or to take uh, earthworks materials off site. And um, that is uh, normally the large amount of HGV movements. We've looked very carefully at the scheme to reuse material uh, to the extent that we can. So a lot of the landscaping that we've proposed also helps us um, to reduce our materials movements. So for example, the false embankments are there to provide visual and noise screening of the scheme from the communities but we're looking to use excavated material in that to reduce the overall impact on the road network. We're also proposing to run haul roads alongside the uh, line so that we take vehicles off the road network and, and move them around within the safer environment of our construction areas. 
and we're looking to build connections onto the strategic road network where we can so that we provide direct access from the strategic road network onto our site at a couple of locations around the A13 and the M25. So we're looking at what we can do in order to reduce the amount of HGVs on the local road network. And then we look at the routes that vehicles are taking through the local road network, and we want to get them off that local road network as fast as possible onto the strategic road network and control where they go. And then finally, uh, within the outline of the traffic management plan for construction, we set out a number of locations where we're going to put HGV bands in place. They won't be HGV bands for public uh, traffic. That's it, it won't be for um, communities or for other businesses in the area, but we'll place self-imposed HGV bands on our own vehicles and they won't be allowed to use those local roads, even if it's a better and far, or a faster route for them, because it, it won't be better because it won't necessarily be safer or appropriate for the community. So we'll put HGV bands on our own traffic. So we're doing quite a number of things. Um, just for councillors' information, the uh, outline materials handling plan that Tim referred to, um, the council will have quite a lot of comments on that going forward. And one of the um, elements of those comments will be um, seeking um, greater commitments to the use of river, um, notwithstanding what Tim's already said. Um, but in, in the case of the Northern Portal site, which is the main site, um, there is a dedicated haul road straight from the port into it. Um, so it would be crazy. Um, plus, you've got DP World. Uh, it's not just all about the port of Tilbury, but there are ports in the vicinity and not to commit to using the river as much as possible seems a bit crazy. So we'll, we'll be making those comments to them in as part of our consultation response. It must be bearing in mind that a lot of the uh, other areas, for example, and you refer to DP World, which is more a container port, but, um, you know, there are other river locations that would equally need to access by road to our scheme. Um, further west, a lot of the aggregates come into uh, to port facilities as well. So it's... Uh, Unlike other schemes that have been developed in central London, we have to look at the wider area because we are in some locations very far away from the river and actually bringing things in by river would have an increased adverse impact on the local roads compared to uh, bringing stuff in on the strategic road network. Councillor Muldowney has a question. Thank you. Yes, going back to HGV uh, movements, I'm still slightly reeling that the numbers that I've read I've got to double now because they're round trips. Um, anyway, that's a good piece of information. But um, I was interested to hear you say that you're putting a ban on your own HGV vehicles. Well, I know that you're taking off uh, the HGV restriction on part of Brentwood Road um, to facilitate the construction during construction period. Um, and... There will also have to be access to Brentwood Road Utilities, U ULH, the utilities, can't remember what the L stands for. Utility Sub Logistics Hub. That's it, Utility Logistics Hub. Um, and the A1089 is also a construction route. So in terms of us in Chadwell, um, we're not, we're going to, we're going to be bombarded, aren't we, with HGVs and other vehicles? I think it's fair to say, uh, and, and we don't want to hide from the fact, that construction of a scheme of this nature is a major undertaking. It's a major operation. It will require a significant amount of traffic moving through. It requires a large number of HGVs. It requires uh, a lot of um, movement of materials and, and vehicles and fleet around the area. Uh, and we don't want to shy away from that. We hope we've set it out very clearly. That is the nature of construction of the scheme, and our job is to try and minimise the impact of that and make sure that it works safely for the community while still delivering this scheme uh, to a suitable time frame. Because equally, reducing the amount to uh, a lower level uh, and, and controlling the traffic on the network would it, uh, to, to reduce it could lead to an extension in the duration of the works 
and uh, that won't be taken well by the local community either. Is there, do you have to provide any mitigation for for that, or there are rules within which? What are the what's the framework within which you um, put extra construction uh, vehicles onto the roads? Are there any limits? Are there any guidelines? Is there the, any um, sort of hard limits that you have to stick to? No. Um, we we need to be able to show that we can construct the work safely and reasonably and uh, we set out the impact on the community and where, where we do have a significant adverse impact on local areas then we work with the local authority to understand that and look at what can be done in that region in order to try and reduce that impact. Um, there's no standard guideline, guidelines in as much as the extent of works that we're doing um, in modelling the traffic, which we'll set out in the DCO submission, goes beyond what is normally done for a road scheme of this nature to try and set out in much more detail exactly what will happen when and, and, and help people understand and, and um, work with the impacts. OK, so it's, it's true to say that there'll be considerable disruption um, more in some areas than other and yes uh, actually yeah, what, I, what, I would say that's fair to say yeah what what would be useful is to know sort of within the overall scheme how, which areas are going to be the most disrupted I mean we don't um, kind of listed out in uh, in order of uh, a ranking uh, there's there's going to be disruption through the area but um, I think it would be fair to say that the majority the, the more significantly impacted area in Thurrock is going to be around the A13 junction and the communities that are living alongside both the construction of the lower Thames crossing and the works that run alongside the A13. Okay, thank you. Don't believe any further questions in the chamber for that one. I'd like to continue. Okay, um before I do continue, I need to go back. Uh, I've, I've, I've had an update from uh, my team, and unfortunately, I need to correct something that I said earlier, so I do apologise for that. We don't offer translation as a matter of course, um, which is in similar to local authorities aren't obliged to provide foreign language translation. Uh, we haven't received any requests for materials to be translated other than sign language or to Braille in the past, which we have accommodated, either from the local community or stakeholders. But that doesn't change what I then said, which is that uh, if there is a specific request uh, for translation, um, please do raise it with us. Um, and I asked you to, I, I think, uh, Chris, you asked it to go to Lucy, didn't you? And yeah. uh, we'll, we'll take that very seriously and see what we can do if there's a need for a translation. Thank you. Although I would have uh, a translator at an event is yeah. what I'll say. But thanks for that. Um, but I would, you know, think it's sort of obvious you probably haven't received a request for translation because the people who need translation are probably the ones that have no idea no. that the LTC is happening. Um, how how would they learn about it? I mean, the people that I've come across is only because I've knocked on their door and actually spoken to them and been able to just about make myself understood enough um, for them to to request that they need they need more help to understand what's going on. OK, um, with that, I'll move on to the next question, I think. So the driver for this project from the outset has been the need to relieve the congestion at not only the Dartford crossing, but also the surrounding link roads on both sides of the river. How do we plan to set up communication of the worsening traffic volume during construction and hopefully alleviated traffic volume on completion so the residents can see the pain they have to go through during construction has been worthwhile and that Highways England have been right in the route that they have chosen. So during the construction, We'll include various types of monitoring um, and for an appropriate time following the opening of the new road, which I'll repeat in a moment. Our framework construction travel plan sets out how the implementation and operation of uh, our construction plans will be monitored, reviewed and evaluated to make sure it achieves its aims and objectives. 
Uh, communications and engagement strategy will be published by Highways England, which sets out how contractors communicate with residents and will include commitments to warnings of road closures and traffic diversions. This includes traditional methods of communication, such as letter and leaflet drops, roadside signage and diversion routes, and information published on our website and social media. We're still developing ideas on communication with local residents and drivers, and we welcome ideas from forums like this on how you'd like us to engage with community groups and individuals uh, to help them understand what, what's going on. In terms of uh, the post-construction, uh, I talked a little bit earlier about the post-operational project evaluation and and that's the work that we will do e each major project delivered by highways england undergoes this process um, and you can find those reports online for each major scheme that's been completed so far that sets out one year and five years after plus the uh, in two year interval um, looking at the how how the project has achieved its targets in terms of uh, carbon traffic and accidents Any questions? No questions from, from, from the chamber. We can move on to the next question. Okay. Next question, what role and involvement will Highways England have in Lower Thames Crossing once all the contracts have been awarded? So Highways England have ultimate responsibility for the project to ensure its successful development and its compliant development with the development consent order. Uh, so we're aware of that responsibility and it is being built into uh, the sort of uh, the works that we're doing to plan for delivery of the scheme. It's built into the contracts and it's also being built into what Highways England develops as a, a client model to control the works that take place on site. We're going to have oversight of our contractors work, obviously, and we will have control over the communications, the engagement and the monitoring strategies to make sure that they conform with what we expect. Highways England will have members of the team embedded into the delivery team for the Lower Thames Crossing and strict protocols for the contractors to report back to us on, on, on progress. We'll closely monitor all correspondence and complaints that come in about the work so that we can make sure that our contractors are living up to the commitments we make and the commitments that they will be required to make to the community. We're really aware that this will be the biggest construction project in Thurrock for years and it's Highways England's biggest construction project. So getting it right is absolutely vital for us in terms of getting the timely delivery and making sure the contractors do what's required but also to our reputation and uh, Highways England's reputation as a delivery of major projects such as this one. Any questions on that? No yep. questions from the Chamber. No. So the next question, um, there is a significant amount of land either side of the route that is designated as land for mitigation. Does this mitigation designate the land as protected for special scientific interest or similar, and therefore permanently prevented from being purchased for development or building in the future? If not, how long is it protected for? Um, so the answer is that uh, once a site has been developed as mitigation for a project, it does have protection and it must be maintained by Highways England. It, it isn't strictly designated as a site of special or scientific interest or anything of that kind. That uh, That's a different type of designation. But it will be protected under planning as being critical mitigation for the Lower Thames Crossing. It is possible in the future that the site could be used for other purposes, but only after following an appropriate consenting process, such as a future development consent order or another planning process that is suitable for making such change. Any future proposals would have to consider both the current condition of the site and the nature of the mitigation it is providing for the historic and the operational impacts of the Lower Thames Crossing. And the, that protection on the mitigation will be in place for the duration that the project is in place. I think, Tim, um, part of the thoughts behind these type of questions is that um, not all of the land you have is maintained as highway, not all of it is mitigation for ecology, and some of it could well be open space. 
and I suppose what's behind this is how how would the um, the land ownership under Highways England, if it's kept for permanent use, um, be protected in the future from things like future housing development? How can it be maintained? Is there something in the land transfer covenants that can restrict future use, particularly given that the stuff in the north is in the green belt? I suppose that's that's so once you've designated it in your environmental master plan for open space, for uh, mitigation, for ecology or for some other open use, how can we maintain that use into the future? So that's a role that Thurrock Council will play um, or, or the relevant local authorities along the route, because for it to be used as any other purpose, it would either be a development consent order or or, or it will be handled through a planning application or similar proposal as a set in place, um, which would need to be administered by the local authority. And therefore, there is a role for the local authority in protecting this mitigation in perpetuity or for making decisions in the interest of the local authority to make a different decision about that mitigation. We will be required to maintain it until such a point as uh, the local authority determines or it goes through an alternative consenting process like a DCO that it should be repurposed for some point at which point compulsory acquisition powers might be used to, uh, to take it away from Highways England to use for another purpose. If, if, for instance, some of the land um, you wanted to dispose of to the council um, for uh, green verges or something like that, that you did not want to maintain, is there a mechanism? Uh. I can still hear you. Oh, no, I can't. Chair, I, I'm... I would try to answer his question, but in all honesty, I don't know where that question was going, so I'm not able to. Sorry, um, I'm back now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sorry, I just had a little phase out. Um, yeah, what I was heading towards is if you wanted to dispose of certain pieces of land, either to the local authority to, or to somebody else, um, how does the future maintenance of that get managed? Do you Do you pay commuted sums? Do you... Do you arrange restrictions on the land transfer? That would be a matter that would need to be looked at in the time at the time in terms of the um, the, the requirements and the proposal. The fundamental requirement is that we maintain that mitigation, we keep it in place. Uh, so, you know, that would have to be accounted for in any, any such transaction at that point in time. The okay. mechanism of that transaction would be a matter for whatever that transaction look like. All right. OK, thank you. Councillor Kent has a question. Yeah, just 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 on that, but very specifically on on verges. Everybody in this room knows that as you drive along the A13, you drive along the 1089, they're absolutely disgusting. What, what are you going to do in the kind of the planning for the future upkeep of these of, of this road to make sure that they're actually properly and regularly cleaned? So Highways England have operational controls over what happens on the road network, including maintaining and managing the verges. And it would sit within our standard operational requirements for maintaining and uh, uh, sort of the verges of a scheme. It, it would become part of the strategic road network like any other stretch of uh, highway across the UK. But, but, but at the moment, you, you, Highways England utterly fail to make sure that roads and verges are kept clean. You're planning a new road, the largest road building project since the M25. Surely you can build something in that makes sure that you can keep it clean. I hear the statement um, and I can't answer whether we do anything specific. And, and Gary, do we do anything? specific relating to that it sounds like an operational measure to me rather than a design measure it is it, it, it's totally an operational measure i mean it, it's like you know the dbfo codes that look after the m25 they have a contract to keep so we all we can do is i was england is is enforce the, the cleaning of that by their operations team 
I think Councillor Piccolo has a question. Just an observation, really. Um, <clears throat> driving around the country, I've noticed that a lot of the, uh, the new roads, um, <clears throat> any greenery or shrubbery that is uh, put along the side of the road now tends to sit back probably four or five metres away from the road. And uh, every so often you actually get a build out down to close to the road. Um, and it seems to be what happens there is that the, the draft created by the traffic going down the road um, pulls any loose litter down towards where you've got this build out there. So I've noticed that you get very little diatribe along the spaces where it's, it sits quite back. The, the, the border and the fencing sits quite back from the, from the road. And I wonder whether or not that's something you're aware about or whether that's actually worth looking into to see whether we can uh, uh, reduce the amount of uh, litter that uh, collects all the way along the road. Can we concentrate it so it collects in certain points which are easier to manage and clear? Gary, is that? I, I just will take that away and thank you very much for your suggestion. Hmm. Councillor Muldowney. Thank you, yes. Um, just going back slightly to um, looking at hard to reach groups again and how they actually engage in consultation. We have had some feedback from farmers that they're busy harvesting at the moment and they haven't got time to read mountains of paperwork or like um, come to consultation events. So will you look again at maybe extending the consultations so that um, that group of people and other groups of people such as those who need translation um, also many areas along the route there's quite deprived pockets um, along the route although not everywhere along the route is a deprived area and given that people have to pay for calls um, and may not have a consultation event easily accessible in their area. I mean, certainly the ward that I represent, we've got pockets of deprivation, less people drive, um, there's less mobility, there's more ill health, um, to make sure that they can actually access the consultation. Because the charging for the calls is actually quite a big roadblock for a lot of people. Um, so I suppose there's two parts to it. There's the charging for the calls um, and how that's impacting on people accessing the consultation if they can't get to a consultation event. Although I do thank you for putting on a consultation event in Chadwell. Um, and also specialist groups like the farmers because they're, prob they're going to be one of the biggest losers um, if the scheme goes ahead. This is their busiest time of year, obviously. Um, will you consider extending the consultation so that these groups can have a chance to access and give feedback? So, as I said in the, uh, my short introduction, we, we have considered whether to extend the consultation and we are not proposing to extend the consultation. In terms of farmers, we have quite an active uh, engagement with farmers up along the length of the scheme which uh, goes on both during and uh, outside of the consultation programme, where we regularly meet with all of the farmers up and down the length. So we engage with them very, very closely um, and talk to them directly about the local impacts on them so they fully understand the proposals and how that's going to affect them. Um, so I think that answers that one. In terms of charging for the call, that is standard practice. Um, and it is only a local call charge. So um, many people will be able to access that for free uh, via the sort of mobile call plan minutes. And even if they are paying via a landline, then uh, or, or pay as you go, it's still going to be a relatively low rate. Councillor Chakwa. Um, I've got these leaflets. Uh, from LTC that, you know, through my door that says that it, it's been extended till December. Although I didn't come with it, but I can maybe bring it next time. Can you clarify that, please? 
So the information, uh, so we are not extending the public consultation. Uh, we, we will be closing the consultation for the public at um, the date that we committed to at the start. We are talking to local authorities. We recognise local authorities are in a slightly different place because they have governance protocols that they need to take it through. So it's our view that eight weeks is more than adequate to review and provide an, an, a response to the consultation material. But we recognise that there are extra steps that local authorities may choose to take their response through that increases the pressure and the time on their delivery. So we are talking to local authorities about um, whether they need additional time to take it through governance. Okay, I think we've exhausted questions on that one. So according to my list, I believe that takes us to the end of the questions that were supplied. So perhaps at that point, I'll hand back to you, Chair. Thank you. I'll just um, briefly go around the room to see if there's any final questions. I think Councillor Piccolo is first. Yeah, thank you. Just uh, to start with, just to thank you for arranging uh, the, extra cons the extra consultation event um, at the Homestead Village Orleans, covering Stamford West, Corringham and uh, the area there. It takes place on Wednesday. I'm a little bit concerned um, I'd like you to ensure or that there will be a full consultation process presentation taking place there and that it's not just uh, lip service to a request by local residents to have an, a meaningful event. Um, so I say I, I thank you for arranging it, but um, I do hope that it is an event of the same standing which is taking place throughout other parts within the borough. So thank you. So um, the um, event at Homestead Village Hall, I think is the one that you're referring to, um, will be staffed by a range of project specialists who will be able to answer residents' queries. So it, it's it's going to have the, the full complement of specialists to be able to give you the advice that you're seeking. It will be to the same standard. Thank you for your assurances. Much appreciate. Any final questions for the team at Highways England before we uh, before we move on? Mm, no, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Tim and Gary and your team, um, and thank you for agreeing for those written responses. Um, could we agree that they'll be um, ready by the end of this month? Is that possible? Yes, that's fine. Councillor Muldoney has one last question, I believe. Sorry, I expect it is the same, but can you confirm the same is true for Chadwell? I mean, we're glad to have an event in Chadwell, um, and I'm glad that it's a little bit further on so we can actually let people know. Um, but is, that will be the same as the one in Stanford. Um, I'm just waiting for that message to be typed in, and then I will confirm to you. I don't want to give you the incorrect information. Yeah, because I've had feedback that there's only been a skeleton staff at one event. So, no, it, it is going to be the same standard. It, it will have the um, full complement of experts. It's worth bearing in mind that because of the current conditions of COVID-19, uh, we are providing... We are continuing to provide all of our experts and, uh, uh, to events. We have reduced duplication of experts. So whereas we might have provided one construct uh, in the past, provided two construction people, we are now only providing one. The reason for this is because of what we don't want to do is to lose all of our consultation team at a single event were there to be a uh, test and trace issue. And I'm talking to you trapped from my bedroom where, uh, you know, I'm going through it myself. So you will see a slightly reduced number of, of teams at staff compared to what you've seen in our previous consultation events going back to supplementary and statutory consultation. We do still have the full complement of experts to be able to answer your questions. And um, so far, we haven't had any issues with getting to the uh, answer the questions with the team. Councillor Massey, could I just come back 
Um, you were very lenient in setting the deadline for Tim and his team. Um, the, if you if you make it the end of the month, and I'm sorry about this, Tim and Gary, but if you make it the end of the month, it makes it very, very difficult for us to use those responses within the council's response to the consultation. And um, therefore... Can we have a week, Chris? Yes, I, I was going to suggest if you can give it to us by um, the early part, that's the Monday or the Tuesday of next week, I would be most grateful. Thank you. Yes, we'll Great. do that. If, if you can record that in the minutes, please, Lucy. <laughs> will do. Thank you. Sorry. You, don't, you know why, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate, appreciate that, Chris. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And, and I mean, we've got no further questions for you. We've um, been a couple of hours there. I think we've gone over a lot of good points. Um, you're free to go and enjoy the rest of your evenings. Or well, you're very welcome to stay. Thank you very much, uh, you. Councillor, you. and thank you all of the council for a chance to talk to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Tim Cheers. and Gary, thank you. Thank you. Not much left of the evening, Fraser. <laughs> yeah, not too much left at all. We're just going to um, go to agenda item six, the work program, which is included on pages seventeen to twenty of the agenda. Um, you'll see for September we provisionally have a transport action net network presentation. It depends on if the organisation can um, have the resources to deliver that to us. And then the health impact assessment update, which should hopefully have a bit more to say than we did last time we saw it. We'll, we will live in Yes, hope. I mean, that's extremely, I mean, yes, we can we can do it if we get the information from Highways England. If we don't, the, the update's going to be relatively short. Um, if they provide us with the information at one of the meetings or in, in written form, then yes, we can update you certainly. But if they don't, and it takes till October, I'm afraid that's what has to happen, if, if that's OK. OK, based on that, does any member have any further items they would like added to the work programme? I'd quite like, at, at some point, to see an early version of the skills and employment strategy that was mentioned a few times tonight. Sorry, Councillor, I didn't quite he hear that. Which strategy? The the skills and employment strategy that was uh, that, that was ah, mentioned yes. a few uh, times this evening. We we have just today, funnily enough, just received an updated version. I haven't even looked at it yet. Um, but the, the so I don't even know whether it it deals with the comments that we made last year. Um, not notwithstanding that, um, we are still pushing uh, Highways England to make that a control document and to set targets like I was mentioning earlier in the meeting. Um, so um, we're happy to try and update you on that. Perhaps in September we might be able to do that. You could you could um, probably when when is the next meeting just out of interest? 20th of September. S sorry. The 20th, 2 zero. The 20th, OK. Right. Um, I don't get back from holiday until the 19th. <laughs> um, so unless somebody else in the team can can write the paper, um, let me talk to the team to see what can be done. But I, 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 I'm I've sure got to be we honest, do something. It, it, it doesn't need to be next time. I, I would just like to see it. In, in good oh, time, okay. to consider yeah, it. Yeah, October, yeah. November, yeah. really not bothered. Would just like to see it. Sure, thank you. Anything further on the work program? No, I think that's it. Um, th that concludes the business of the meeting this evening. I'll now declare the meeting closed at twenty-one twenty-seven. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.